Savan. I am the director of Silent Cry, Inc., and we are here tonight to talk about uh, post-traumatic prison disorder, Shawana W76337, and we are going to have a beautiful conversation about trauma and what that means. So my bill is about mass incarceration and mental health. And we're going to address mass incarceration and mental health. And what the bill looks like is asking for harm reduction um, of guards, of correctional officers. Um, we realize that in, the, in this state, uh, any other states that no correctional officers are mandated to therapy and they are in harm reduction uh, as well. And so we're also asking for therapy outside of the traditional norms, everything before you get to medication. And so for a lot of people on here um, who are advocates um, like Isaac who deal in art therapy, Art therapy is one of the really big things I'm asking for in this legislation. I am asking for our um, holistic approaches to healing, trauma-informed therapists, life coaches, um, facilitators that do uh, peace and uh, peace uh, circles, and all type of alternatives. Definitely, um, journaling is, is really big because it helps people uh, not only to release pain, but with people who are writing clemencies and, and different things in that manner. So I'm asking for everything before we get to medication. We're clear that prison is a big business for big brand medications, Pfizer and all these companies. And how can we create healing? My hashtag is you got to birth pain like birthing a baby with no anesthetic. It's just something you have to go through. And so I believe that this bill will allow healing. It will reduce recidivism. It'll allow people to come home in a better space than they left. And it will allow people to be mentally whole in their totality and learn coping mechanisms. And I believe it will reduce recidivism. I believe that um, guards will become better because they will be trauma-informed. They will be um, cared for as well. And I believe that it'll make an institution, though not a good place to be, a better place to be because people will be in a better mental state. Um, and I think this is what, you know, my bill encompasses and, and it's post incarceration as well. And what I'm really hoping for, um, to capture in this bill is to get it put in the health index because we talk about post-traumatic stress disorder and all the benefits that that has. But coming out of incarceration, we don't have benefits um, to a disorder that, that the world doesn't recognize. And so it is time that we understand that going to prison is not a normal occurrence and that it has residual effects, not only on us, but our families. It has residual effects on how our communities and how we interact with other people and how communities receive us. And so I feel like post-traumatic prison disorder, Shawana W76337, is to restore not only people incarcerated and post-incarceration, but our communities. Because when we have people who do not come home well, it affects everybody. So that is what I am aiming for in this bill. And so I am so excited um, and pleased that Dr. Hazel Dukes has joined us tonight. Let me tell you how I marvel at this woman because I wrote a resolution and it was passed by the NAACP at their uh, national convention in Detroit last summer. And to know that there is a woman who believes in this bill and believes in people. And I, I just want to tell her thank you um, for everything that she does on behalf of us daily and for how she fights for us, even when we don't know that she's fighting for us. 
But most of all, thank you for believing in somebody that you did not know and you could not see. Um, my gratitude for her is endless. So I want to welcome and introduce Dr. Hazel Duke. If everybody could, I uh, wish we could all clap it up for her. This is an amazing woman. Thank you so much, Shawana. What an honor it is for me to participate this afternoon. Let me just tell our listening audience that uh, when you wrote the resolution, uh, the president of our New York City Housing Development brought the resolution to the state conference and we submitted it to the national. You never know because it's made up of people from different backgrounds, from law enforcement, from health, uh, from every profession you want. And so uh, they, uh, with the covering letter that was submitted by the state conference, uh, I, you are right, I had not met you, only what Lynn Spicer told me about you and what you were about and what you was doing. And so I said, by all means, because uh, you're right, uh, women, uh, when I met with uh, you and your other uh, colleagues, women is the backbone of our community. If we keep our women whole, we keep families whole. It's no in and out about it. Yes, fathers play a big part. But when we have women at the helm being uh, in the household, being a part of the community, being a part of pushing and seeing that things get done, it's the women. Uh, and so for me, uh, to meet you and to meet your other colleagues, I was absolutely excited, uh, enlightened to hear uh, what you had gone through and what you had come back. And you were a hit at our convention last year in White Plains. Uh, you was a star. Uh, from that, many people have said, we must do a uh, senator, as you know, State Senator Brian Benjamin. Uh, was there who you met at that time, and he's done a lot of work uh, on criminal justice. He is the sponsor of the Eric Gardner chokehold. And so we know that we have a lot more to do here. And I'm committed, uh, the New York State NAACP, the national NAACP, is committed uh, to look at reforming the criminal justice system from the bottom up. You're right. Uh, we have to make sure that our guards who deal with this day in and day out, we have to make sure that they are whole. They are women too, as well as men. And so you're right. If we want our communities to become whole, we have to look at uh, traumatic stress from every angle. You just can't look at it from certain angles. And so I'm here today to make a full commitment to you and to the listeners, uh, to the health professionals, to your research team, that as you research and get data, please share it with us as we continue to work in, in this state uh, with uh, the criminal justice. Yes, we made some strides, but we know there's a lot more work we have to do. And with our legislators, uh, we must get this done uh, to make our continue to make sure that our community is whole. And how do we do that? Health must be a big part of this. And it must be front and center of our agenda. And so we have a health uh, component uh, along with our criminal justice uh, component, the five strategic plans that we work on, uh, civic engagement, voting, census, uh, just got off a phone call about the census. We hope that our listeners who have not participated in filling out the census that you do that. Because all of this take budgets. All of this that we are talking about that we want done take budgets. And so we need budgets at the federal level, the state level, uh, the city level, the county levels, at every uh, step of the government. So we must participate. We must fill out the census. It's only 10 minutes, three minutes. You can do it by phone or whatever. Uh, you have many people 
that have not heard about the program, have not met Shawana Vaughn and the other women, but when they meet them and hear their stories and see them as, their, as our sisters, they are willing to be a part of the push, uh, the legislation that we are looking forward to. Mm -hmm. And I tell you that we can get this done if we all come together from every uh, sphere of our profession, teachers, uh, guidance counselors, uh, nurses, all of us must work together to make sure that our communities are whole. And especially those who come return home to our community, we need them. They are mothers, they are aunts, they are grandmothers, and we need that uh, for our children, for us as a community to grow and be prosperous and be productive. So I'm here uh, to lend my support, whatever I can do. And I'm sure that the panel, I looked at the persons who are going to be in the panel discussion, I'm sure it's going to be fruitful and all of us will learn and go forward together. Thank you so much for inviting me to uh, give my thoughts on this and to give more encouragement and more than encouragement to be an advocate for this great work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Dukes, and I look forward to seeing you on Tuesday. Thank you very much. I'll be there. Yes, ma'am. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lauren Hagani, and I'm the Director of Research and Social Impact at the Combined Arts. And thank you so much for tuning in to our second post-traumatic prison disorder town hall. Um, thank you especially Shawana, Pastor Isaac, Dr. Corlin, Griffith Hunt, and all the people who are pouring their hearts into this work and helping organize this bill and, and this event. You are all such an inspiration and we are really incredibly lucky to have people as compassionate, intelligent, and dedicated to justice as you are, especially during these difficult yet transformative times. So tonight we are fortunate to have a panel of people who can lend wisdom from their personal experiences and professional work on the importance of trauma-informed justice. And I'm very eager to hear their insights and stories, but first I want to give a brief overview of the science of trauma and why it's so important that we discuss it today. So I recently listened to a TED Talk from a woman named Tabitha Mamiri Kaguri, who grew up in Uganda as a refugee. She discussed how she and generations of women in her family before her suffered from physical and sexual abuse that they never shared with anyone, including their own family and children. She described how it was expected that they bear their suffering in silence because showing their wounds to the world would mean not only recognizing their own hurt, but bearing the stigma of being seen as damaged. During her talk, Tabitha shared a phrase that stuck with me. She said, trauma not transformed is trauma transferred. She described this passing of trauma as a relay race. Unless something is done to disrupt how the game is played, the baton will keep getting passed from one person to the next. When people speak about trauma being real, lasting, and transferable, we do not mean this metaphorically. Trauma is physiological. It alters how our brains are wired, the ability of our immune systems to fight diseases, our hormonal responses, even how our DNA is read and transcribed. In fact, severe childhood trauma dramatically increases the risk for seven out of the 10 leading causes of death in the United States. People who suffer from severe childhood trauma have triple the lifetime risk of heart disease and lung cancer and suffer from a 20 year difference in life expectancy. The trauma I'm talking about here is not trauma that comes from failing a test or falling off of the swing. Adversity is a natural part of life that we all have to bear at one point or another. The trauma we are discussing today refers to threats that are so damaging and pervasive that they become woven into the fabric of how we think, how we behave, and how our bodies function. 
People commonly mistake current psychological pain as being reflective of issues in one's current life, but research overwhelmingly demonstrates how adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, severely impact people's long-term mental and physical health. During the first study on ACEs, researchers asked over 17,000 adults questions about their exposure to childhood trauma, and then correlated these experiences to health outcomes. What the researchers found was striking. 67% of the population had at least one ACE, and over 12%, or one in eight people, had four or more adverse childhood experiences. There was also a dose-response relationship between ACEs and health, meaning the higher your ACE score, the worse your health outcomes. It's easy to be inclined to write these poor health outcomes off to bad behavior. You might think if someone has had a rough childhood, then they are more likely to smoke, do drugs, or do things that would hurt their health, so this isn't so surprising. But this focus on behavior as the mechanism for the problem, rather than engaging with the invisible emotional wounds the trauma has produced, is exactly the problem that we are here to discuss today. Trauma goes deeper than what can be seen from behavior. In fact, even people with high ACE scores who do not engage in risky behaviors still suffer from health ed. issues at higher rates. Researchers connect to something called allostatic load, or the repeated activation of fight or flight mode. The fight or flight response is useful for survival in dangerous environments like a prison, but becomes damaging when it is actively um, when it is activated constantly, even in non-threatening situations, like when someone returns home. Trauma also affects the pleasure and reward centers of our brains, which influence risk for substance use issues. Trauma impacts the prefrontal cortex, which is critical to learning and decision making. Trauma can be seen in MRI scans from the amygdala, the brain's fear response center, which impacts people's risk of engaging in high-risk behavior. And trauma can also be seen in our genomes, not only in the generation that directly experienced the trauma, but in their children and in their children's children. This demonstrates very literally how the baton of trauma can be passed through generations, contributing to keeping communities in cycles of pain and oppression. None of this can be separated from ethnicity and race. And black and Hispanic children are more likely to have experienced adverse childhood experiences than any other group. And in this way, trauma is not only woven into people's bodies, but into the fabric of how society functions. Trauma spreads within communities and is reproduced through systems of oppression that may take different forms, but serve to reproduce the damages of generations prior. Here again, we see that unless something is done to disrupt the relay rapes of silent suffering, punishing pain, and deep-rooted discrimination, the baton of trauma will keep getting passed on within families, communities, and generations. This is why it's so important that we are here today to discuss why all people must carry an understanding of what trauma is in all of their work, relationships, and experiences in order to disrupt cycles of suffering and silence and create communities of healing. So now I'm going to pass it over to Pastor Isaac Scott, who will kick off the panel with some introductions and questions. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to read you. Very good. Peace and blessings, everybody. Peace and blessings, peace and blessings, peace and blessings. I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much for everybody, to everybody who is here right now, you know, those who will listen to this later, who will chime on in the middle of the conversation. Um, I just want to just bless your heart right now. Thank you for, for taking the time to listen tonight because what we're going to go into today is, 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 is important and it's a lot more important than even the title could suggest. You know, we're talking about community trauma, collective trauma, you know, that trauma which is not um, so readily seen, you know, as, as some of the panelists will, will let us know. So I'm going to um, just put up a screen really quick of our first um, group of panelists. And I'm going to, before I do that, I see that we have a lot of folks streaming. And I just wanted to ask you all, please put in the chat, let us know where you're streaming from. Let us know the city and the state you're streaming from. We want to do a little research here. We want to see who's listening tonight. We want to be able to sort of um, measure um, how much of a reach we're having with these discussions. So if you could just let us know where you're calling in from, city or state, that would be dope. Appreciate it. I'm going to switch the screen right now and introduce our first group of panelists. 
And I'm going to ask everybody else who's on the call line with me to just turn up their monitor if they're not on the first discussion. So I'm going to um, introduce the first group of people. Um, I'm going to state that Mr. Coley is not able to join us this evening. His um, health has been not too well. So I'm just going to ask that everyone on the line just lift him up in prayer right now, um, whatever it is that you do. But just let's send some love and healing towards his way and, and a speedy recovery. Amen. Just to, just just sending some love over to him in acknowledgement of his of the great work that he's done as a youth ambassador, um, working with um, Out of the Ashes. Um, if, if you just if I if you just read his bio, it was amazing. The brother's amazing. I would definitely encourage everyone to look up Mr. Coley Harris um, from Out of the Ashes, which is a Delaware program, um, and learn more about the work he's doing and support that work because that work is important. Um, the first panel that we're going to have is on. Thank you, thank you, guys, for leaving those. I see we got Queens here, we got San Francisco, we got um, Lenore, North Carolina. Thanks, guys. Keep putting in those cities and states. Let us know where you're listening from. Um, the first panel discussion is going to answer this question. What does it mean to experience trauma, and why is it important that educators, doctors, correctional workers, families, and all people consider trauma in their lives, relationships, and work? And to help us... Um, flush this, this, this question now. Seems like we got a lot of questions. We got um, questions for the panelists and we have a question that sums up what the panelists will talk about. And it seems like um, that's a good place to start with a lot of questions. So our first speaker I want to introduce is Tanita Hopkins, who's the Community Engagement Manager at the Secaucus Foundation. If we could just snap it up, give it up for her right now. I want to give it up for um, my brother, Corey Green, who's the co-founder of HALA a healing justice organizer. Can we give it up for Corey right now? I want to give it up for my man, Dr. Robert Fullylove, Bob Fullylove, professor of social medical sciences at the Columbia University Medical Center, associate dean in commu of, of community and minority affairs. Can we give it up for Bob right now? Super, super happy about all of you guys. This is dope. Um, yes. Um, <laughs> next we have, um, Sharon White Hair again. I wish I could just hug you through the phone, Sharon. Um, Sharon is the Women's Community Justice Association as Executive Director, and she's the co-convener of the Justice for Women Task Force, and you'll learn all about what she's doing soon. And last but not least, I want to introduce Ayula Mitchell, who is a healer, facilitator, and a life coach. Can we snap it up for Ayula, Sharon, Bob, Corey, and Tonita right now? Yeah, this is love. Super happy about this. To make this easier for everybody, since I put this picture up, I, I said everybody, I really just mean for me, as I transition in, in this discussion, I want to, um, I'm just going to keep it on speaker view, if you will, so you won't see the whole gallery, you'll just see the speaker talking. That I, I feel like that'll just keep it simple for, for everybody. So I'm gonna um I'm gonna swing my first question over to you, Ayula. Um my my question um to you first is so so just a little background. Um it made me laugh because when I read your titles, healer, facilitator, life coach, it sounded real familiar and it sounded like you should really be called a pastor or a minister as um as those positions are positions of service. So I was really um I was really touched by um, your, your, your titles and how you describe yourself. But without sharing anything identifying, can you tell us what are the biggest areas of individual trauma you see with the people that you work with, that you coach? Well, thank you, Pastor Isaac. And you're right. You read it right. I'm actually an evangelist. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I don't usually use that title, but that is actual, that's a fact. 
the biggest thing that I see with the people who I work with, just to give a little bit of background, I am in California. I don't know if I'm the only one out here representing for the West Coast. And the majority of work that I do is behind the walls in county in the county jail as well as in the prisons here in California, working with those that are incarcerated and those that have come home. And one of the ways that I like to describe the work that I do is helping people to understand and heal from the trauma before prison, the trauma in prison, and the trauma of prison. And I think it's absolutely important and also essential that everyone who is working with those behind the walls are able to, as Shawana has said in her bill, benefit from services as well. Just as for myself, having been in a space working in the punishment system for the past 35 years, the trauma that I've experienced, whether it's um, directly things I've witnessed um, behind the walls or it's the trauma, the secondary trauma of hearing people's stories year after year after year. And also, you know, the, the reading that I've had to do with my work about people's history. And there's a lot of trauma there. And those that work directly in with those behind the walls and those coming home, they need support too. And one of the things that I, I, I made a note of is family members. Everybody needs healing. Everybody has been traumatized in one way or another. And if you are black or brown in America, you have a whole different level of trauma. We literally have trauma in our, in our DNA. Mm. Mm. Oh, literally. We have trauma in our DNA. That's 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 real powerful right there. That's real powerful. I'm gonna swing my next question over to to Corey. Um, I was thinking about my brother, all of the the work that I did with you all in the past, and promoting, helping to promote the um, Healing Justice Movement album. And this is a perfect place for for folks to to know more about that and, and to get to learn what that is like, because that's community healing at a much deeper level. So can you tell us um, what the Healing Justice move, Movement is, but specifically tell us about some of the key points or those data quote analysis that you all created during your observations and how the Youth Organizing Collective has used the arts to address community trauma. Where, where? Healing Justice is our strategy responding to historical tragedy now we all on the zoom they gonna be mad at we soon as the tip fall the state pull up slow we dip off it's routine it's street knowledge but we not here just organizing against a policy picture me give an apology to those people who lied to me standing on spirit Speaking of prophecy, I went from property to half freed and back to property. Shit is like Monopoly, and it used to be all about the cheddar. Now it's how our lives link all together. We sit in circles and make it better, collectively hurting together. It's old pain. It's new pain. We like no more pain. And ever since we learned about white supremacy, we ain't been the same. I'm talking about the slaves, ships, whips in the chains. I'm talking about the cuffs, courts, metal detectors, and up north trips. And how families get divorced quick. And how culture get lost in other wisdoms. And how our intimate relationships is filled with isms. And how that trauma be laying beneath the surface. Nah, I don't think they get the purpose. Nah, shout out to YOC. Shout out to our ancestors. Uh, real quickly, I just want to bring our ancestors, our spirits um, into the place, man. I think the people who taught me about healing justice um, are people like Cara Page, Dr. Sean Jenright, um, the Bedford Hill sisters, um, Cheryl's on the call, Kathy, Donna, Sharon's on a call, the Resurrection Study Group, Brother Pastor Isaac. So I don't know if I, you know, I'm the only, I feel like I've been learning from a lot of people. And I think that's what healing justice is. It's an old technology from my ancestors. 
uh, from our experiences, um, from both the beauty of our experiences and the pain of our experiences, um, and turning that, and turning the pain, going into the pain and find, finding the wisdom in the pain, and finding the lesson in the pain, and be able to turn that lesson um, into community organizing, um, into relationship building with younger people and older people. And I think more specifically, us at HALA, um, give some context, our organization um, was really born inside of New York State Prison. Um, and really listening to the stories of, of the Attica Revolt, um, of the Green Haven Think Tank, um, of the circles that the Bedford Hill Sisters was doing. And from that, we started building our own program, our own idea to hope. Um, so that story alone just lets me know that when other people are struggling, we didn't even know Kathy. I didn't even know Eddie. I didn't even know Cheryl. I just seen they struggle. I just seen they hope. I just seen the I just seen the cobblestones that they left behind. And and I was able to see that wisdom in that. More directly, when we started Hala, we want to build a process to develop young people and organize from a non-traditional approach that came from those lessons. Um, that came from how do we use our ancestors? How do we use circle keeping? How do we remember our connection to the land, um, to water, to other, other relatives like plants and to animals? And how do we struggle when we see where we're disconnected with those things? Um, so healing justice is a lot about transformation and self-reflection. Because I, like, I was born as a dude in a hood. And, and one of the things I learned about healing justice, like part of the way that I've been hurt as a as a dude growing up in the hood, is that like like some women, some trans people, even my elder people when I was young, like I didn't really respect their humanity. I didn't even understand what their humanity was because of the conditions and the socialization I was getting in my hood. Um, taught me that that a certain kind of like humanity was okay to live. And as I became getting these cobblestones. I had to go reflect. It, it led me to reflect it, to going back into some of those wounds to figure out who I was. And then I got to ask myself, what you do with that? What, what you going to do with that? So I think at the spirit of healing justice, it's a deep, deep question to yourself about who are you? Who's your ancestors? How is justice? How is intersectionality? How is the world shaped around you? How, who you owe justice to? Who you who you willing to journey with? What are you committed to? What are you not committed to? Um, so I think that's one part of it. I think when you are in that ingredient of like who you are, what you got to grow from, what you got to heal from, like who what you got to be accountable to, um, what pain you got to show, what pain you got to lean in, um, what shame you got to own. Um, who you who. Who you might owe healing to? Who owe you healing? How you accept of somebody apology? Because I think what I'm trying to get at is that, and to Ayula's point, that like the interpersonal traveling of trauma in our relationships, in ourselves, in organizing and movement building, um, it, it, it's hard. So the wellness, the like, like, like the questions you ask yourself, the process you got to put yourself through from my understanding of healing justice, is a deep one. The second component of it is, how do you translate that to your ancestors? How do you translate that to your community? How do you translate that to like building with, with, with a journey? How do you put that into a journey? How do you journey with somebody? How do you journey with folks? How do you, how do you understand that in that journey, there's going to be moments where you want to quit? There's going to be moments where you get hurt. There's going to be moments where the people you love the most that you think that is all about justice, they might not be all about justice. There's going to be times that you get hope and that you lose hope. But part of the first part I was talking about, how do you, what are you grounding yourself in? What are you asking yourself? What are, what's holding you down? Because that's going to be needed for when you journey. Um, so I, the last thing I would end off by saying is that um, we had the fortunate of creating a process in New York City with our young people where we reached out to about 60 to 70 other youth groups in New York City, asking them if they want to be vulnerable with us. They want to talk some real stuff with us. Um, and we got a chance to have healing circles with these young people, and we created surveys, and they told us about their relationship to systems of oppression and how they heal. 
And we asked them to give us feedback on how we held space with them. How, how did that feel? How did we show up? Um, and from some of that reflections in circle and doing some analysis after the circles, we created an album, a healing justice movement album that really, for our young people on YOC, the Youth Organizing Collective, that really reflected like the wisdom that they was hearing from the young people in the survey. Um, so they was able to turn um, a healing practice, a deep vulnerable conversation into a methodology, into a survey that then later went on back out into an album, into a mixtape. Um, and, and, and that's another way what I mean about journey and that the knowledge doesn't stop, that it, it must keep moving. And that mixtape is now on track to help us think about next steps with organizing. Thank you very much, my brother. Um, I, I appreciate what you said about um, accountability because me and Shawana was talking earlier and we were talking about the gun violence and all of that going on. And I won't, I won't spend much time on that now, but we were talking about how do we hold people accountable but not hand them over to a justice system that will literally hang them? You know, what, what, what is that method of accountability? So I, I appreciate when you said, who do you owe justice to? It's not who, not just who do we owe, who do you personally owe justice to, you know? Who do, who, who do you need to seek some forgiveness from? Some healing needs to happen. So I, I appreciate you for saying that, big bro. Um, I'm going to switch, I'm, I'm going to um, go over to you next, Sharon. Um, just, um, we do understand that there are different experiences across gender, and I'm thinking about the um, Women's Community Justice Association as a broad group. As a broad-based group of women with lived experiences within the criminal justice system whose mission is to help transform the NYC justice system for women, can you tell us a little bit about the trauma that you've seen in the lives of women that experience incarceration? And how does the experience of incarceration shape in their lives? For example, like during those reentry phases and, and, and during th that recidivism process. And that, yes. I go from there. I know that's a lot, but I know you you got it. Okay, hi. Thank you, Pastor Isaac. It is um, definitely an honor to be here. And I just want to say to Shawana that um, and si Silent Cry, you know, what awesome work that you're doing. And I'm just to, honored to be here um, to help support you um, in this. And so to everybody else, hello, good evening. Um, the Women's Just, uh, Community Justice Association, we work, with, we work with all women. And so, especially in and out of the, the criminal justice system, trauma, you know, just doesn't start within the prison as the, the beautiful woman said, um, I think it's I, Iola. Um, it starts prior to that. Over 90, 95% of women are traumatized way before they even get to the prison system. And so, you know, what happens is, is that it becomes this compounded trauma. Then if you're from the black and the brown communities, we know that it's historical, it's generational, it's ancestral, it's all of these things. So once you move through the system, now it's, it's, by the time you move through the prison system and come out into reentry, it's packaged. It's packaged trauma, you know. Um, and women face trauma in, in many different forms, whether it's childhood abuse, or, or you know, domestic violence. Um, most women are traumatized by men, and I just have to put that out there, you know. And so, being inside of a, a correctional system where there are men correctional offices where there are people in authority here we go again you know women are abused they're sexually um abused they are you know treated with with the most uh, uh disrespect um they are dishonored they are de devalued um and so you know on top of why they're there right so we you don't get to you know, unpackage that. 
And I, and I think that it's not so much a matter of understanding trauma for people that, that, that are traumatized. It's understanding that there is trauma, but how do you reconcile with the trauma? Because there's some traumatic experiences that are never going to leave you, right? They're, that you're never going to get over, right? But how do you reconcile that and, and continue to move on and progress and don't allow it to stagnate you mm. in your life? And unfortunately, we have systems that are in place that are not built for us that are not correctional, so I don't understand why they even call it that, um, is not rehabilitative, the traumas is not dealt with, so then people come out and it just, it, it metamorphosizes itself in other, in other things, in other ways, right? People don't even, some, especially women, don't even know that they're traumatized, right? Men don't want to, you know, a lot, it, it's about that, that pride and that evil. So they're not going to address their, their trauma either. They're going to sit on that. Right. And so, you know, unfortunately prison is just a place of another, another, uh, uh, way of slavery. Right. Let's keep that where it's at. And so this is another way of just removing people, stripping people from their families and, and having them in free labor and not keeping them uneducated, all of these things. And so we just, you know, need to recognize how do we come together, not only as, as an individual, right, but as a community and what does healing really look like, right? And so when even working with the women, I am a social worker, I'm a pastor, I'm all of those things and it all interrelates. And what does healing look like? Healing looks different for every individual because everybody's inch is measured differently, right? It's measured differently. And so, you know, it's getting people to understand how do I move past what is what has happened? And, and that's very hard when you have packaged trauma because you have to then strip away the different layers that have been compounded, right, from family, from from childhood, from all of the things that, you know, you might have been hurt, grief, broken relationships, you know, all of these things, raised in a single, watching your parents on drugs, whatever that is, you know, and, you know, I am, you know, um, a woman who is on both ends of the spectrum because I am formerly incarcerated. I did 11 years, but I'm also now on that end where now that I, I gathered this information that I'm able to help, you know, other women that are coming out because I am a woman's advocate that are, are, are coming out. And it's not, it's not easy. It's, it's not easy. It's, it's something that, Every individual has to be able to come to terms with and say, you know, I have these traumatic experiences and I need to start unpacking them, even if it means that, you know, I have to I have to go through this. You can't go around it anymore. Right. We can't we no longer need, you know, can allow people to keep knees on our neck. Right. I'm just this, this is trauma. This is trauma. And the prison system is just another way of, of, of doing that. And in order for us to get to that healing part, we need to call it what it is. We need to say what it is. We need to be able to acknowledge what it is, right? In order for us to start now laying those bricks to the road of healing. Preach, Pastor. Come on now. All right. Come on now. Um, you said something. Um, how do you reconcile trauma? How do you how do you make sense of it in your life? How do you not let it stagnate you? And how do you use that energy or that passion or that pain to drive you in a positive direction? How do you reconcile trauma? Thank you for saying that. 
Um, you said something else, package trauma. That reminds me of the first discussion when we had Dr. Hunt here who said, listen, folks don't just get trauma from incarceration. They come in with trauma. And you said right. the same thing. So I appreciate I appreciate your words. And just in, in lines of that package trauma, I want to go over to you, Bob, because I'm thinking about a few years ago when I participated in some work that you was doing at the Mailman School of Public Health. Um, and it was around post-traumatic stress for people who were formerly incarcerated. At the moment, you know, um, I have been home about two years and I was very, very appreciative of, you know, that group of people to be able to share what I have been through and just know that there was a group of people that um, understood. And that's probably one of the things that has helped my own mental health and being around the people who know what I've been through, right? Because I can heal in those spaces. But I was hoping that you could, um, you could, um, my, my question to you, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about, this is not in what I wrote to you, but I also do hope that you can tell us a little bit about that work that you were doing at, at that time and any findings you might have had. But also, um, how should we understand post-traumatic prison disorder as a public health issue, one that affects us all? And how do you imagine a supportive trauma-informed environment? Everything that I've heard thus far from our participants represents state-of-the-art recognition of the problem and a way of confronting it. Corey, in particular, I think mirrors what we've always known. If you can name it, you can work with it. Uh, everything about identity, what part of who I am was shaped by experiences that are so painful, I might not even have language to describe it. What do I avoid as a result of processes that I don't quite understand but lead me to do this as opposed to that? Naming it, being able to describe what part of your life informed who you are now because of the trauma that you experienced back then, that's what we know is where we're headed. Part of what I have been doing with a variety of other folk who are interested in this as a piece of science is to say we all know it exists. We're not trying to prove whether or not there is such a thing as trauma during and after prison. That's obvious. Mm. The big issue is how do we understand it? How varied is it? If it is different for each individual, is there some structure to it? Are there common elements to it? What I know from the work that uh, I've done with Mindy Palillo, who is probably the leading African-American social psychiatrist in the United States, is to really understand with her 400 years of inequality movement last year, that we are in a world that structures trauma every day from slavery on. We are constantly reminded of our second class citizenship. We are constantly reminded how much less we are. We are constantly reminded of how, for whatever reason, we don't measure up. Those are lessons that we are taught every single day. They are part of our socialization. They're part of our acculturation. We have to unlearn those things frequently to free ourselves. And basically what we're doing is saying we've now gotten a better focus on it. We can describe it in better terms. There's a science to this. And where there's a science to this, I know that ultimately there can be something that looks like, if not a cure, at least a treatment. Most important part of the experience I had with Mindy in the 1990s when we were working at Lincoln Hospital's uh, substance abuse program in the, in the South Bronx with Michael Smith was working with large numbers of folk, women, who were addicted to crack cocaine largely because of traumatic experiences that they'd suffered in the course of their childhood. Their addiction to crack wasn't because they were seeking thrills. They were addicted because they were trying to medicate a condition that they didn't know how to name, but which was obviously driving them and their behavior to points of self-destruction, childhood abuse that happens when you're four or five. You have no language for that. You don't know how to describe that. And what you're often told is don't you dare say another word mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. As soon as women were able to name that that's what had happened to them, as soon as they were able to see the connection between their addictive disorder on the one hand and the trauma that drove them to it, the issue of recovery becomes that much easier. I want to use that as a template for all the other expressions of behavior that come out of trauma, specifically trauma that occurs because of incarceration, and think that there, too, there's a real possibility for something that looks like healing. Now, now that we've named it, 
now that we can talk about it, now that we know it's something that's driving so much of what we're seeing in our streets from senseless shootings and killings to just all around behavior that we don't quite understand. Now that we know that so much of it comes from that, I think there's, there's real hope that we can experience something like recovery. But there is one point that I think it's important for me to add before, before I end. We haven't said anything about COVID-19. I think all of us who have people on the inside are really clear that the trauma that's, ex- that's occurring there where you can't talk to anybody, you're not really clear whether people have your health and your best interests at heart. There is massive trauma that's going on every day in almost every correctional facility I know about, literally because of the mismanagement of this pandemic. So we're talking about trauma right now as a sort of a constant in the work that we all do. Are we all clear it's going to get a lot worse? That at some point in time when the smoke clears, people are going to look around and go, oh my God, what happened? Uh, I teach, as many of you know, in six prisons in upstate New York as part of the Bard Prison Initiative. I haven't been in one of my classrooms there since March 9th, but I hear word that in some of the facilities in upstate New York, it's bad. I'm a Louisiana boy. I understand that a whole bunch of the joints down there are even worse. I I just think that part of what we're doing here is not only getting a handle on the nature of this issue and how we should be talking about it and handling it, I think it's also a moment to say that we should be preparing preparing for the future because there is going to have to be some recovery post-COVID-19 It is going to be ugly, and the more prepared we are for it, the more we're able to say, this is a trauma. We know something about how to treat this. The greater the likelihood we'll get the resources to do something about it. I think at some levels they don't really have a choice. Let me stop there. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you so much. You said, um, how do we understand trauma? What is its forms? What are its forms? And and, and, and once we can make a science out of it, you know, then we can at least find some sort of, um, I don't want to use the word cure, but um, some sort of remedy. Um, we can understand it better. And I, I agree with that. Like what shows up all the time in trauma? You know, it may not be the same all the time, but there may be some factors that show up all the time in trauma that we can identify and locate. So I, I, I definitely... You remember that in that meeting there were 60 people? There were 60 different stories about, here's what happened to me when I got out. And it all had a common theme, something that you did on the inside to adjust, to make sense of what was going on. It's something that you carried on the outside. But on the outside, it's no longer productive. You're not, you're not inside anymore. Mm. You don't have to be doing that. And people wanted to get rid of it. In a lot of instances, it was really annoying, you know, having to only sit in a subway car when there wasn't anybody right next to you. I mean, all the things that people know come from what happened to them on the inside. What we're trying to do is say, from that variety, is there a common core, a set of common elements? Because that's the moment when people start to figure out, okay, now I know how to name it. Here's how I began to deal with it. Let me stop there. <laughs> My brother, I'm, 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 I'm on. This is, this is beautiful. This is beautiful. I'm coming your way, Tanita. Um, often when people talk about those who have experience with the criminal legal system, there is a tendency to locate the problem within the individual. How does an understanding of trauma help us to see the bigger picture and locate the problems within the systems? So thank you, Pastor Isaac and Shawana, for having me on. What I would say is if we understand trauma um, from a place of a professional place and from a mother who has sons who've been incarcerated is that we will actually start looking at the fact that trauma is not restricted to those who are incarcerated and those who are formerly incarcerated. Trauma has happened to all of us. And once we start recognizing the trauma that we've actually been through ourselves, then maybe we could create that safe place for individuals to feel comfortable to talk about what they've gone through. where Bob just mentioned something that was really key. I have a son who has actually been released in November and uh, he's he's been going on to uh, meth. And I asked him at first, I was like, you're just doing the same thing because I was listening to everybody else say that's what he's doing. He's, oh, he's, he's institutionalized. Not recognizing that the fact that this child was brought up in a home where there was domestic violence, um, there was an absentee father. There was a lot of things that he experienced as a, as a young boy that probably impacted him. 
Then not to mention when he was 19 years old, he goes into a maximum security facility where they, people were getting killed on the yard, rocks in a sock. Um, I can't expect him to come out of prison and just get back to business as usual. So for me as an individual, I would say part of uh, correcting that whole system is we got to go back to the drawing board. We can't, we've got to humble ourselves. We've got to have conversations, hard conversations with individuals who have been incarcerated for those who are actually experiencing the guards, corrections, uh, administration, all of those, have those hard conversations and stop pretending that we know everything. And, and we, if we start looking at that, we can look at the fact that we too have trauma that we've hid. And whether we know it or not, it's going to come out in some way, shape, or form. Maybe ours is uh, behind closed doors because we drink too much or we eat too much or we're watching porn or whatever and nobody gets the chance to see what we're actually going through. But as far as those when we're working with individuals and we really want to be committed to their success, we're going to have to be open to finding out uh, what they really need. Not, don't try to put a Band-Aid on it by saying, oh, you need to get a job. Oh, this is just your lifestyle. we got to really offer that safe space for them to be authentic and comfortable to talk about that trauma. Because when they go into prison, um, just say, for instance, if they were abused as a child, physically abused. When they go into prison and they hear someone getting raped in a cell, what do you think that's doing? It's re-traumatizing them. And that's unfair for us on the outside to look at them as being someone who don't want to get assistance. When you're going home, some of the people who are working there are going home beating their wives. So um, that's, that's what I would say is that we've got to be open to learn. We've got to listen. We've got to have all voices at the table because we don't know everything. We got to humble ourselves. And that's part of the problem with this world now is that everybody's acting like they know and they don't have a pulse of the population that they're trying to help. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think right what you just said right there, everybody think they know what needs to be happening. I mean, this is definitely a, a listening and watching and preparing moment. I appreciate you saying that i'm gonna go over to um minister mitchell i mean ayula mitchell <laughs> um you very boldly call yourself a healer could you tell us some uh what are some of the healing strategies you can suggest for people who have experienced trauma to employ in their everyday life because i'm sure as this conversation is getting deeper and deeper folks are starting to even in their homes deal with their own trauma and think about it so what are some practices some healing strategies you can suggest for people one of the things my brother Corey said um he mentioned who you're going to journey with and who you're going to heal with is a very important part of healing some things that we can do individually is journaling a lot of writing Trauma lives in our body, and the more that we can get it out, the more we're able to heal. And I do a tremendous amount of writing, and I jokingly say I, I write because it's cheaper than therapy, but it's true. And so one one way of healing is to get all the uh, all of the trauma, well, not all of it, literally out of your body, but you can release some of that trauma, those feelings, those emotions, things that come up by journaling. Um, also... Find a community, and I'm not su suggesting that that's easy, but if you desire to build community or to be in community that's safe where you can really um, explore your healing, where you can really talk about your trauma, where you can be free to be you, to be your authentic self, your broken self, your raggedy self, I'm talking about myself right now, then it's part of your healing process. And, you know, unfortunately... We can say therapy, but I know from my family's experience, finding a therapist who was quote unquote qualified to deal with our level of trauma, of loss, of harm, was really, really difficult. Um, so, so therapy in a non-traditional sense, we sit in circles, um, and I love, shout out while seeing that album, if you haven't heard it, it's, it's very healing. Um, it's cathartic. We sit in circles where we're able to heal because we're in a safe space 
with people who have similar traumas that we do, and we're able to talk about it. So writing, journaling, talking about it. Um, some people do exercise. I don't do exercise. But they, you know, find, I know my daughter uh, runs. She said running clears her head. And so there are many different ways that you can do, that you can, many different things that you can do individually. But there's also something about being in a collective space. You know, I spend a lot of time when I'm out there with Holly, with Corey. I have a, I have a community out there. I have a community here where you can just, you just have to find people, build community where you can just really let it all out. And it's safe. You're not going to be judged. You're not going to be um, given unsolicited advice. You're not going to be told, I know how you feel. Those are some of the things that help. And, and I, when I say I'm a healer, I'm, I'm in the process, which is ongoing, of doing my own personal work of healing. But I facilitate other people's healing. I, I provide a safe space for people to talk to me about whatever it is that they want to talk and, and and the skill set of digging a little bit deeper and what I like to say is being challenging without being confrontational because it's so many layers to our trauma and it's so many things that people need to talk about where they can feel safe and they can feel comfortable and they don't feel judged and so that's the work that I do and unfortunately you know I was listening to people um, and these all these wonderful organizations that people are a part of and, it's, and people ask me, well, what's your organization? What are you a part of? And I'm like, it's me and Jesus. And that's the healing work that I do. And that's, it's not even work, it's ministry. It, I know that this is what God has called me to do. And so this is what I do. And it was through the trauma and tragedy that my family experienced that I came into this space. Thank you so much, Ayula. You said um, challenging. How do we be challenging without being confrontational? And it reminds me of when the Lord says that we should be as wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove, right? So I appreciate, I, I definitely appreciate those words. I want to go over to um, another one of our um, healing facilitators, Corey. I'm coming back to you, big brother. As an artist, community activist, and change agent for policy reform, can you tell us your thoughts on how the arts can be better positioned as a methodology for healing as well as justice reform. And this is that question, bro, that gets into what we was talking about the last time we was on the phone that you wanted to build about, because I think the way you said it <laughs> is perfect. Yeah, that's, that was an all the way set up question for you, bro. Nah, you definitely pulled that one all the way in. Um, now, I think, um, I think just to zoom out some, me personally, what I understand about policy, just thinking about at least the last 500 years in this country, how laws, treaties, administration, the, the Ten Commandments were, were documented. A lot of black people, indigenous people, queer, and other intersections were not really included in that. Um, and I make that point because there's been a historical reality that a lot of our people a lot of people don't even understand what policy is and all or have been continuously hurt by policy. So that's one. The, the, the other point I want to make is that um, I think at the creation of policy, like when it became the Ten Commandments and it became structured as treaties to push Native people west, um, part of it was writing down some cognitive words to kill ancestors and kill spirits and kill indigenous wisdom and replace indigenous wisdom with documents um, and laws and administration and have administration alone be the structure that facilitate society. So I still to say that um, from what I've learned today is that um, to heal, to change things, um, it definitely needs a spiritual component to it. It definitely need a rhythm of energy in it. And we've learned that over the years from policies that we won when women became able to vote, um, policies around the civil rights movement, um, policies even up to the day to like no child left behind where they seem like we win. They seem like, 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 oh shit, we going somewhere. But it's 
wrapped up in the administration of America and of laws and policy that can easily be shifted to some other administration of the system. But secondly, even when we win in the implementation, the hearts of the people, the spirits of the people, like you might you might change somebody to change your policy, but they still don't really give a fuck about you. They still don't really care about your ancestors. They still don't really care about your future. So, so I feel like you lose only but so much of the policy can go through. So the last point I get to is saying that like, like I think yeah, I think liberation is a spiritual thing. That's part of what I'm saying. I don't think policy could get us free. Um, I don't think I think we we in America we in the, this structure we got to fight for policy. But I, when I think about Harriet Tubman, when I think about Nat Turner, I think about freedom. When I think about the people who give me freedom, they would Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. They were journeying into a spiritual realm that the material world didn't matter. The material like where they was going, it didn't matter. And I feel like art, poetry, vulnerable stories. Um, they communicate an emotional and an, a spiritual wisdom that changes heart, that heals heart. So, and also, when you got policy today, just thinking about our Healing Justice album, um, that album is a lot of policy, a lot of analysis, a lot of a lot of a lot of big ideas that are turned into hooks, that are turned into themes that are turned into hip hop, so that our community, particularly young people who've been hurt by policy and long documents and white papers, who would never read about no mass incarceration and a traditional white paper paper, they get to bump and vibrate to a policy conversation that they already know, but they get to make sense of it um, in a context that they can respond back to. So that's another thing about it. like when. A lot of the policy leave our people out the conversation. It wasn't until I went to a co- became a college student and, and started organizing with 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 um with Cheryl and Michelle Fine and 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 Dr. Devon Pryor and Eddie Ellis that I and I was like 29, 27, 24 when I started learning about policy. When I understood what policy was. So I make that statement, even if we win policy, I'm kind of clear that most of my family don't know what we want. I'm pretty clear that most of the other people next door to my family, they don't even know what we want. It ain't even in their hearts. Um, so I think music and art and poetry and emotional communication, which comes through the art, it gives our, our people who are not tapped into policy that way another language, another wisdom for policy. And then secondly, I don't think the material impact of just changing policy gets us free. Our people's hearts need to get healed. Our people's emotions need to get healed. And the arts and the, and, and, and the music and the poetry and the, and the videos and speaking the spoken with the unspoken. Um, saying what is hard to say um, through rhythm and through beats um, that, that, that can communicate to somebody else who, who knows that that was hard to say, but I like saying it through a rhythm. Um, so these things, I think, are really important for policy, too. And particularly for grassroots folks who have been historically disconnected from the policy conversation. And I think about my own journey back to the policy conversation. It's been a fight. You know how many times I got to study at night? You know, I mean? you know how many times I got to read? You know, you know how many times I got to sacrifice chilling with my family to read about policy, to learn how to catch up to, to what's going on in the world? And for the majority of historically oppressed people, like taking care of their lives, we're not in that conversation. So how do we get policy to them? I think is a question that like the arts really, really, really communicate. Thank you very much for that, King. I appreciate that. And I appreciate how you put each and every aspect of that. I'm going to um, transition back to you, um, Sharon. Um, as we all have learned from yourself and um, other women leaders like Cheryl, who we'll hear from, Kathy and all of the, like, I appreciate you, Corey, for mentioning all of them because they've been just as important in my life and helping shape, you know, how I advocate. So I, I definitely appreciate the women leadership that I've been able to sit under. And then I have a woman pastor. The Lord is good in giving you women leadership. I just want to state on that because there's something there. 
um, that 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 that's missing, you know, when when we have male leadership. Not to denounce that, but I think there's something that we can all learn right there. But um, Sharon, um, as we have all learned from yourself and the women leaders in the movement, the woman is usually the backbone of the family, and her absence is imperative. Can you speak to how the incarceration of mothers and other primary care providers can evolve into family trauma, what that looks like, and what needs to be done to end that cycle of trauma in families? Yeah, that's a loaded question. Yeah, it was fully um, loaded. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so... Take your time. Repeat, repeat that first, the first yeah. part of the question. Yeah. The first part is, can you speak to how incarceration of mothers and other primary care providers can evolve into family trauma? Well, the, I mean, it's been said, you know, um, I think Dr. Hazel Dukes, you know, said it, said it best that the women, women are the heart and the pulse of the community, of the family. You know, unfortunately, you know, men are no longer that. I mean, you know, back, you know, years ago, historically looking, yes, you know, men were looked at as the head of the household. If you want to go biblically and spiritually, men should be the head of the household. But the reality is that that's not the case. It's the women that are carrying the family. It's the women that are caregivers. If you go to a men's prison and go into the visitor room, it's women that you see. If you go into a woman's prison, it's women that you see. And so by, by stripping a mother away from the family, whether it's her children, whether it's her parents, her siblings, because we as nurturers and caregivers, we take care of our parents. We take care of our siblings. We, you know, we, we feed the community. And so the trauma is, is again, compounded on top of trauma, on top of trauma, you know, um, because there's already, we come to the table traumatized, right? So once you strip away and, and a, a mother from the family, and naturally, what, you know, what does that do? That traumatizes the children, right? That traumatizes the parents. No parent want to see their daughter or, or their child, you know, and, and not excluding men, but talking about women, um, in, in prison or locked up. You know, it starts to dismantle. When you incarcerate a woman, you incarcerate a family, you know, unfortunately, when you incarcerate a man, you incarcerate a man, right? Because the woman is the, the glue. She is the weaver. She is the person that keeps it, that keeps it together. So yes, not, and then, you know, the children, for some children, uh, they saw their, their mother get arrested, you know, going to visit her in, in a prison or the jail and having to walk away and, and seeing that their mother still has to remain or go, go the opposite way. The treatment of the family, even going into the correctional facilities. What happens when there is even family members who puts all of this negative, you know, everybody got an opinion. They want to put this negativity into, you know, the children of say, oh, well, you know, she ain't never coming home or you're not going to, you're going to wind up just like your mother. And, and so, you know, it, we contribute, unfortunately, you know, and that's a whole nother topic in workshop even as, as black and brown of families, we also contribute to our own trauma, right? Um, but the fact is, is that we're already traumatized people and we just, it just compounds and, and packages itself step by step by removing the only really source of support for, for the children right, for, for the, the family unit, right, for the community and, and encage them, you know. And so, I mean, trauma, there's just no one trauma, right? So when, when it comes to incarceration, 
there's just multiple traumas that that happened with that. And what's that? The second part. This okay. The second part is um, more like a where do we go from here? But you answered part of it in like what does that look like? And what needs to be done to end that um, cycle of, of trauma in the family? I think, well, truths, right? Because I think in a lot of families, right, we, we hide things, you know, we, there's, there's secrets and, and we're just as sick as our secrets, right? We don't talk about things. Oh, mommy and daddy went away to college. No, <laughs> they went to prison. They went to jail. They need to understand that. And I thank God that, you know, I had that conversation with my daughter. And although she might not have quite understood what that meant, it's about standing in your truth and stop. You know, I, it's, it's bad enough that for many years, right, we're talking over 400, 500 years, we have been taught and told an alternative reality. Right? It's bad enough that we were taught about a Christopher Columbus that was some martyr when, when he wasn't, right? And all of these other people, we were taught as black and brown people uh, 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 about whiteness, right? And, and that we derive from monkeys and apes and all of So the reality is, is that we have been so harmed, right? We have been penetrated with these alternate realities with this sickness, with this diseases of what people wanted us to know or believe or think that we ourselves now have embraced it, right? And, 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 and into our own families, even with the Christmas and the Easter bunny and all of that stuff that don't exist, right? That's not our reality. And so it starts with truth, right? Once we're able to talk about what is really going on, what is really happening. And it may be harmful if people might not, we know that some people can't handle the truth, but when you give it to them, they're able to process it, right? In a way that in the end, they say the truth shall set you free. That comes in more than one way, right? In more than one way. So I think that, especially for us in the black and brown community, that with our families, we need to just really be open, open them closets, unpack them, them old raggedy suitcases, dig up the bones buried in the backyard, and let's have a talk. Can we just talk? Can we tell the truth, family? That's it. And once we do that, once we do that, we're moving towards healing which is a continuous thing. And I'm going to leave it at that. That's right, Pastor. Go ahead, man. I'm loving all these ministers on the phone right now. You guys are amazing. This word is, the word is heavy right now. I just want to thank you all for that. I'm coming, I'm going to, um, just in the spirit of what you um, were just ending with, I'm going to go to you, Tanita, and then I'm going to end with you, Bob, and then we're going to transition into our second discussion. Um, I definitely want to continue to encourage people to leave questions I'm seeing questions come up on the Facebook, but not on my document here. So that's a, um, a shout out to my team. Can we get some of these questions on this document so we don't miss them? I see a lot of good ones. I was able to capture some, but I can't get them all right now. Um, Tanita, people who experience incarceration come by way of so many different backgrounds and different traumas. We know that language and representation in this country is a different experience across race and culture. Can you tell us about the Language Matters campaign that you all are, um, have just launched, um, as well as what shared language should we begin developing as we are reimagining the criminal legal system? This is sort of like a prelude to our next, our next um, um, town hall. Okay, so um, the Securist Foundation decided to join the movement for, with the Language Matters campaign on uh, June 12th. And as you know, words are powerful. Um, you know, you've heard, everybody's heard that old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt. Well, we know that's a lie. Um, for us, what, the, the, what we're looking
looking at is using this campaign to basically educate and bring awareness to individuals, um, whether it's the community, whether it's uh, colleges, whether especially media, just the way that they will depict individuals who've been formerly incarcerated and incarcerated. Uh, when you hear the word ex-con or convict, if you hear inmate, if you hear prisoner, these terms are demeaning. So we, we want to be a part of the uh, changing the narrative, so to speak, where we want to make sure that we're letting people know that these are humans. I'm not my past. If you had a past, if you were promiscuous back in the day, you wouldn't want anybody to bring that up 20 years later. We're not saying that, you know, people, um, they should be, we've heard that people are saying stuff like, um, uh, you once you've been a criminal, always a criminal. But that's that shouldn't be the case. Once I've paid my debt to, to society, I should have the freedom and flexibility to be known as a human. We we know plenty of people who are graduates. Um, they've got their master's degree. Their attorneys. Their mothers. Their fathers. Their uncles. Their aunts. Their entrepreneurs. There's so much more than what they've been limited to by what they've been referred to. And that's what this campaign is all about, is about bringing awareness to this. Uh, we want to uh, bring bring awareness to the media. We want them to know that, uh, again, we just want to make sure that they understand we can call people individuals. It's about humanizing people and, and not looking at them as less, uh, restricting them or dehumanizing them by constantly referring to them as the crime that they committed. And sometimes they didn't even commit the crime. But uh, right. if, if you refer to them as someone who is, uh, like, say, for instance, I'll name some, I'll name drop right quick. Uh, Jimmy Gardner, Jimmy C. Gardner, incarcerated, wrongfully incarcerated for 27 and a half years. But if someone were to look at his background, they would say, oh, my God, he he's uh, this rapist. That wasn't the case. He didn't even commit the crime. And so why should we be held hostage for our past? We, sh we are, It's all about becoming the individuals that God has created us to be. The thing that bothers me about this whole thing is uh, with the uh, faith-based community. I'll be honest. Because as a faith-based community, we're quick to say that Jesus gives us second chance, third chance, fourth chance, fifth chance. Uh, we want this grace, we want this mercy, yet when it comes to the individuals who've been formerly incarcerated, we're not willing to do the same thing. And that's unfair. You know, if if God tells us that we, we're a new creation in Christ, why come these individuals don't have that same opportunity? So our campaign is basically making sure that we help to be a part of that solution where we are bringing that awareness and we are making sure that we tell people instead of saying uh, ex-con, ex-felon, how about find out what their name is? How about call them by their name? How about say, hey, Corey, how you doing? What are you doing in this? You know, what are you doing now? That's my brother right there. You know, how about saying, hey, Bob, uh, what's up? Tell me everything you're talking about. It's amazing. You know, Sharon, my sister over there. Oh, my God, you are amazing. How about learn their name, learn what they're doing, learn what they're bringing to society. Because one thing about it is when you start recognizing the value in an individual, what happens is then you get a chance to experience true community reform. Because now I've just actively engaged somebody who other people have thrown away and I've given them the opportunity to bring their gifts to the table. And guess what? We need them because they know something that the rest of the people out there trying to help these at-risk youth, they know something that the, that, that the professionals don't. They know how to speak their language. And so, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really passionate about it because I don't like to be referred to as anything other than my name. And I, if I could tell one quick testimony, um, I my son, my oldest son, he was actually uh, just celebrated his six-year release date on Sunday. And so we had a dinner for him, excited. And my daughter-in-law, whenever she uh, sent me a message on Mother's Day, she didn't tell me, oh, I'm so glad you uh, raised you raised an a ex-felon. He had two felonies, right? She said, mom, thank you because he's a good father, he's a good husband, 
He's a, a good provider. She named all these other things that he was, and not once did she mention that he had been incarcerated. And that is what this Language Matters campaign is. It's about seeing the person as a human. It's not about looking at them, what they've done, if they've done anything, or their past, because that's like a double life sentence. Thank you very much, Tanita. And I know that we like come way over time because we still got a whole nother discussion. And I know some folks have to leave early, so I do appreciate everyone who will be able to stay on. Um, I do like to respect time, but I respect this conversation a lot more because there's a lot being said here that needs to be said that hasn't been said. So I don't want to in any way rush people from talking. So I'm not going to do that. Um, Bob, my last question on this discussion is for you, my brother. Um, and then we're going to introduce the panelists for our next discussion. Um, thinking about the ways in which schools and organizations have inflicted institutional trauma on individuals and communities, as the Associate Dean of Community and Minority Affairs at the Columbia Medical Center, how do you personally account for ensuring the settings in which you are, that you work are trauma-informed? So what are you doing in your role to ensure trauma-informed practices are taking place? Yeah, more than anything else, uh, we have been guided by two things. We are trying to do more to be good neighbors. I'm here in Washington Heights. Columbia University sucks. As a neighbor, has been responsible for a substantial portion of the gentrification in Manhattan. Getting people to recognize that as one of the primary trauma-inducing incidents that you can imagine when people are uprooted from their homes, when they are displaced because of uh, urban renewal, because of gentrification, because of uh, eminent domain and its use in the creation of too many places that don't welcome us. Having folks from the community help challenge that and having students themselves one of the most important things that's happened in the course of the last couple of weeks is how students themselves have risen and asked the university, what are you doing? What's been your role in all this? Columbia University has had to recognize that a good portion of its wealth in the 19th century came from the slave trade. Because students are willing to speak truth to power, um, one of the things that we do is, especially because of their connection to the communities from which they've come, their communities give them strength to do this kind of challenging of what the institution is all about. And I, at least as somebody who uh, 56 years ago was uh, part of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, I was a snake field secretary for a number of years. I'm really proud of the fact that we're revisiting that moment again. Students are basically coming up and they're saying, there's a world out there that you have hidden from us. There's a world out there where you had con you've contributed your fair share of a horror and your fair share of trauma, now's the moment to address it, to recognize it, to apologize for it, and then do something about it. it. Seems to me that the movement that we're seeing at this moment is exactly the moment where institutions are being forced to look at their past, or being forced to understand their history, or being forced to understand their role in promoting trauma. And they're now being asked to be called into question for it. And I, I think the fact that for us like this, where we're all, as a community voice, saying we are committed to do more than just talk about it. We really are all about challenging the status quo. It seems to me this is the thing that's probably going to do the most to drive institutional change. So um, I think all of us who have been here and talking about ways in which experiences that we've had informs the work that we do. Uh, in the movement, we used to say we are yours in the struggle. We understand that we're not about finding answers. It probably won't happen in our lifetime. But what we do recognize is that as a struggle, it is ongoing. And as part of that struggle, as long as we are clear that as long as we draw breath, we are in it, we're going to be okay. Let me stop there. So I'm going to bring us back as a group. Um, I just want to thank you all. Oh, I'm, I'm muted. I'm muted. Okay. We're all back as a group. I just want to thank each and every one of you. Can we just really quickly snap it up, clap it up for, for everyone who took the time on this first panel to share their wisdom, their love, and their light. I appreciate you guys so much and everything that you said. This has been so informative, and we're only halfway through. I'm going to um, put up a, a, a screen here, and at which time I'm going to ask that all of the speakers from our next panel... Um, just turn their monitors off and everyone who is on 
the first panel, just turn your monitors off for a minute. And everyone who was able to stay for, you know, the q and A, I I appreciate you. If you can't, I totally understand it. And not, no, 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 it's, it's, it's okay. I, I apologize again for us going over. But you, certain things you just can't rush. And when people are, are, are talking and giving testimony, we don't want to rush those things. So I, I don't want to be that person. Um, our second discussion will, will cover the question of how do we take advantage of the moment that we are in? What does trauma-informed policy programs and lawmaking look like? And for this discussion, we have Stephanie King, who is the director of student wellness at Columbia University. Can we snap it up for Stephanie? We have Khalil Cumberbatch, who is the chief strategist for New York, New Yorkers United for Justice. Could we, could we hear for Khalil? We got Britton Smith, who's a senior organizing strategist for Reform Alliance. Can we give it up for Britton? Can we give it up for Lauren Washington, who's co-founder of Anti-Bullying Crusades Organization? Amen. As a parent, I'm really appreciative of you. <laughs> you know, um, can we give it up for um, one of my mentors, Kim, Kimberly Westcott, who is a Columbia University School of Social Work anti-punishment attorney and activist for human rights grounded collaborative communities? Amen. Right. And can we hear from my, my big sis? who um, I've had the pleasure of working under at the Center for Justice for the past five years, Cheryl Wilkins, who leads the Women's Transcendent Program. Can we just hear it for everybody, for all the great and wonderful speakers? Yes, 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 yes. You guys are wonderful. I so appreciate you. Um, I'm going to do the same thing like I did last, last discussion. I'm going to just put it on speaker view. And I'm, we're going to go from there. Khalil, I'm going to start with you because I know you got to leave soon, big bro. I'm going um, to throw our first question over to you. Let me just fix my windows here. All right, cool. So our first question to you, my brother, is how do national and state policies such as, um, such as changes in immigration laws Policing practices and criminal justice, excuse me, criminal justice policies impact how people experience trauma. I'm going to read the question again, just so everyone can hear it. How do national and state policies, policies such as changes in immigration laws, um, policing practices, and criminal justice policies impact how people experience trauma? Yeah, thank you. Isaac, um, one, for all of your work that you've done to corral everyone and get us here onto this video call. Um, uh, two, let me just say that it's great to see folks like Cheryl, um, Sharon, who quite literally raised me in this game. And so anytime that I could have any opportunity to be in their presence, it's a learning opportunity. Uh, three, I want to take some time, and I would be remiss if I didn't take some time to say that Shawana Vaughn is the fucking truth. Mm. And that she is a woman who has not only pulled all of these amazing people together, and everyone here is a complete testament of her and how we feel about her, how we want to support her. But she's also pushed a bill in two states, <laughs> almost by herself, raising children uh, and a slew of other issues that I will assume that she said at the beginning of all of this, uh, uh, at the beginning of this uh, 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 town hall. Uh, and, you know, for that reason alone, I think it is worth saying that, you know, I'm here to support her. If I stop talking right now, I would have literally achieved my goal, which is to show up for her. And I think that that's something that we can do not only for each other, but also and most definitely for women who are doing this amazing work and who are all too often doing it uh, or not compensated properly and who, and who are all too often doing it without any real recognition. So I just wanted to say that. Uh, to get to the answer to your question, which is that, uh, well, the short answer is that, uh, is that those systems, the immigration system, policing, the criminal justice system, uh, all exacerbate trauma. I don't think that that's something that's would surprise anyone. It, I don't think it would definitely surprise, surprise any of the panelists. 
and I don't think it would surprise any of the folks watching this. Um, and, and that's largely because every one of those systems mentioned has a direct lineage to uh, chattel slavery in this country, which I don't think I need to go on about how much generational trauma has actually stemmed from that experience here in the U.S., an experience that this country has yet to still grapple with and address. Um, and if we did that as a country, I dare to say that we would have a much stronger foothold in addressing other trauma that stems uh, from that experience here in this country. The, the other thing is that the uh, immigration and criminal justice systems um, are two heads of the same monster. And when we talk about those experiences, we cannot talk about them as if they are siloed. And I all too often say that we cannot end mass incarceration and, and, uh, and we cannot end mass incarceration without ending mass deportations and mass uh, detention and vice versa. Because the reality is that they all lean on the same pillar and principle, which is that we as a country have a long documented history uh, of othering, dehumanizing, and outright criminalizing uh, folks that just don't fit right into the into what the common language is or what the common narrative is of the country at that time. And if we look at history, we don't even have to go back to the beginning of this country. If we just look back a hundred years, we can see that at any given time, this country has always found a reason to otherize some subsect of the population. And that's before we even talk about what happened to the indigenous folks in this country. And so uh, the criminal justice system and immigration, um, they are not designed to address uh, a trauma and they're definitely not designed to minimize it. That's why I say that it exacerbates it. Those systems do exactly what you shouldn't do when you're trying to address trauma. For example, when you first go through the system, you have to continuously retell your story. It, and especially if that story involves some level of trauma, because that's Khalil. You still there, Khalil? I don't know if we lost him. I think we might have lost Khalil on that. Um, but um, I'm going to swing. I wait for him to call. Hopefully, he calls back in and we can let him finish what he was saying because we definitely want to hear it. Um, I'm going to swing my next question to keep the flow going. I want to swing it over to you, Britton. Um, as a as a faith community director, uh, um, for Marshawn, I, I do want you to speak to the capacity you're comfortable in, Big Bro, to the to the point you made earlier. But I, I just mentioned this because I saw it in your bio, and it's what helped me to develop this question. So feel free to answer this how you see fit. But um, yeah, yeah um, blah blah blah. Yeah. How do we begin to educate our communities about perpetuating trauma at each level? And how do we mobilize as a collective to target political reform? That's like what I want to know in any capacity, big bro, that you want to answer that. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, again, thank you all for, for facilitating this discussion, having me, inviting me for this discussion. Um, I do wear a few hats uh, as the organizer strategist with March, March On uh, or as the with Reform Alliance, Faith Community with March On, political director for Cap Alpha Psi. So uh, in each of those capacities, it's, I do see the effects that trauma has played, um, even starting with the, you know, what we do at Reform Alliance, focusing on probation and parole reform. Um, you start seeing these institutions that basically cultivate and incubate um, traumatic experiences. Uh, I see what Khalil was going about having to retell your story and then, um, you know, as we talked about political power, um, just today, the Supreme Court uh, denied lifting the ban that was upheld by the 11th Circuit Court down in, uh, in Atlanta, which would have allowed hundreds of thousands of uh, returning citizens their right to vote in Florida. And that's a huge blow. And what that also induces more traumatic experiences. Um, if I think I have a win, if I get out uh, and I'm returning to my life 
and I've, I've done what I was required to do by whether it was the state or federal government, and I'm restored at one point, and then to find out that, you know, watching MSNBC, CNN or something, or Fox News, whatever your preference, and you say, my right to vote has just been denied again, that's demoralizing, very demoralizing. And these traumatic experiences keep compounding each time someone someone thinks they make progress. Um, I'm a I'm a former athlete, so I, I usually use a lot of sports analogies. But you know, it's all, it, it's it's like when you watch a football game, and your team is moving down the field. Next thing you know, you're ready to celebrate, and then you see a flag on the play. That's demoralizing. It it, it continues to move you back. And if at every progress, at every level. Um, even in trying to gain that political that political arm, we find that we're still held back. It promotes more and more traumatic experiences without that cultural healing. Um, you asked an overarching question about how do you take advantage of the time we're in now. Right now we're seeing the winds of change, a lot of social justice change, a lot of activity moving around the, the nation. Um post the the death of George Floyd or the murder of George Floyd and what we're seeing and I'm I'm chiming in from the the deep south the deep red state of Mississippi and we have our own battles and our own bouts but one of the things that we were able to do this legislative session was remove the confederate emblem from the state flag which on the surface seems like such a great gain such a great political move, but it's only symbolic um, because it comes at a cost where the governor then turns around and vetoes uh, a major criminal justice bill after it, of course, has passed both houses of the state legislature. And you often see a lot of times people retaliate votes on, on certain issues that affect us most, that give us actual tangible gain. The, a criminal justice bill, while I'm a a Mississippian, and I love my home state, and I'm proud that we will no longer bear the uh, Confederate battle flag in our state emblem. If you gave me a choice to take down that flag or help facilitate the release of 2,000-plus individuals in our criminal justice system, I would have chosen to take that number to reduce and bring home so many individuals. And understanding what our actual political power um, can do and where it is, uh, I, I, I would like for us to become a little more aware of what, how to utilize it, how to strategize that. I think it's very significant even as we talk about voting and leveraging our power and our, our power in, in voting and voting as it affects our criminal justice system. Um, right now, as, as a millennial, part of that generation where I have so many of my, my peers and those who are coming immediately after me who don't believe in the right to vote. Uh, however, they have very, they have exercised this right to protest and it's been successful in these rights to protest. But the protests go hand in hand with the right to vote um, because that, that um, the voter rolls is where you get the um, jury, uh, the, the, those who get to uh, get called and selected for jury duty. So if I'm not registered to vote, I can't serve as a jury. I can't serve on a grand jury. So I have no opportunity to directly affect whether you, another one of my peers, my cousins, how they get sentenced, how they get read their due process. So understanding that it's bigger than who we put in the White House is bigger than who we put in our state houses. It's about the, our ability to exercise our political power to keep so many of us out of the courthouse. Thank you, my brother. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna kick it back to you, Khalil, because I seen you came on, um, so you could um, just finish out what you were saying, and then I want to go over to Stephanie, Lauren, and Cheryl because there's some. Um, there's some trauma in the schools that I, I want us to, to touch on. Um, so, Brother Khalil, um, finish what you were saying earlier, bro, but um, 
answer the next question too. What is trauma informed justice? What recommend what recommendations would you make to policymakers on how to push forward trauma informed policies during this time? Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't want to stand in, in the way of our sisters getting some time. And thank you for coming to me back, uh, Isaac. I know I have to jump off. My apologies, everyone. Um, so I, I, I won't finish up the question that I first uh, uh, started answering. I will say in terms of answering the second question is I, I honestly don't believe uh, that something like trauma-informed justice is possible. And I'll say, and, and, and here's why I say that. Uh, because the term trauma-informed and trauma-informed justice, I think, is a, it has become the same way that cultural competency has become a term that's kind of like, well, the system has already co-opted that and has already given it its own definition. On top of the fact that trauma-informed justice still puts us within the same framework of the current criminal as I've heard from <coughs> reference, we all know that justice in its truest sense is impossible in the current system that we have. It's because it's the way that the system is designed, the levers that are that are rewarded for pulling, uh, many other reasons. And so when we say trauma-informed justice, I would I would really urge us to start to start um, uh, 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 giving some really full context in when we use that term and how we use it. I would encourage us, because as I heard someone on the previous panel, about language and words, I would encourage us as a movement to continuously evaluate the terms that we use all too often in the best of intention, but I believe that it gives uh, the system uh, an, an out and it gives the players in the system an out, particularly if those players are savvy enough to use the language that they hear us using. Um, and so the second part of the question is what recommendations would I give to policymakers? I mean, the, the reality is that I'm gonna, uh, I'm going to echo what was what, what was just said is that we need to vote the people that we are looking to as elected officials to have the highest pension of risk. They are the ones all too often with the lowest pension to take a risk. And especially if they are, uh, you know, career politicians, especially if they have higher aspirations to office, which many of them do. And I would say some of them for the best reasons. But the reality is that if they want to get to that higher pedestal, they have to get reelected. And the only way to get reelected is to make sure that your constituents are pleased. Now, if your constituents are constantly telling you that criminal justice, social justice issues are important to me, or if you come from that background and we elect you as a people, then that's a language that we don't have to sell you on. What we're doing is saying, if you exercise your political capital as you were entrusted to do, then the reality is that we will support you not only in the ballot, but we will support you in the streets and we'll support you in the media. And unfortunately, this is something that we learned the hard way in New York State as it relates to uh, pretrial. That, that was a debacle that I think uh, uh, all too often was thrown on the was thrown on the electeds and how they folded. But the reality is that we went to the same people who have the slowest pension for risk and and assumed that because we use the right language, because they look like us, and maybe even sometimes they talked like us that they would be the ones to kind of have the, to have the, to have the, uh, they would be the ones to hold the line. Uh, and, and the reality is we, we also, um, how that went. Now, I'm not saying that legislation isn't needed to help us get further. I think that Shawana's bill, the uh, PTPD bill is a much needed, huge step because what it does is this, it forces the system and many systems, when I say the system, I'm talking about criminal justice, but many other systems that feed off of and interact with the criminal justice system to do exactly what you need to, to do exactly the first step that you need to heal, which is all too often identifying and acknowledging that there is a problem. We all know that post-traumatic prison disorder is a real thing for people who have served that time and for their loved ones who've seen us come home the reality is that that thing is real. And the, and, and the bill that Shawana is pushing in two states, I, I need to keep saying that because it's not like she's just doing it in one state. The bill that she's pushing in two states, I think is a huge uh, game changer because it sticks the flag in the ground and says that we need to start associating trauma and post-traumatic trauma with the prison industrial complex and the prison experience. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, my brother. I appreciate you um, coming back on and, 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 and saying everything that you said. Um, and I definitely want to thank you for calling out language because as, 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 as movement leaders and change agents, we have to always critique language. And what are those terms that are being used? Me and Shawana was just talking about the term black on black crime and how that's a racially charged term because there's no such thing as white on white crime or crime is proximitable. So you, you, um, any race experiences crime from their own um, race. So that term was created for black people. So that, you know, questioning these terms we use is very important. Stephanie, um, in your time working at Columbia, how have you seen um, both individual and collective trauma manifest themselves into student behavior? And can you tell us more about the Nightline program you oversee? Sure. Um, thank you for having me here tonight. And I know we're short on time, so I'll, I'll try to be succinct. Um, um, we could go as long as we need to. Don't, don't, don't cut okay. short what you need to say because it's important. There's people on the chat right now who are really, um, they, they really need this. So say what you need to say. Okay. Um, you know, I often think about the role of higher education in society in general, especially in the United States. Um, and, you know, even just recently with the murder of George, George Floyd or even the you know tragic death of Naya Rivera, the first thing people say is, oh, I'm going to start a college fund for your children. As if like when you're four or six years old, the first thing you need is college fund. And so it's, it's interesting the role of higher education and the idea of one's stability or opportunities in life and whether higher education institutions are acknowledging that or taking that seriously is is another question. Um, I think when young people that have experienced trauma get to college, we see students not be able to ask for help, not be able to express vulnerabilities, um, and whether they are, you know, accessing all the support that they need in order to be successful in these environments. Um, and I don't know that the institution is making it easy for them to express those concerns. And so we, at, at Columbia, we have a program called Nightline, which um, Lauren was a part of when she was at Columbia. And it's a, an anonymous program where peer listeners to other students can be on the phone lines 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. and, you know, just pick up the phone and you can hear another voice of a peer. Um, I think the good thing about that is it's anonymous it's a peer, it's someone that's like you or has a, a similar experience at, that you've had that can, ex, that can offer you advice and understanding on, you know, how to move forward. I think oftentimes when people are in a, a moment of crisis or um, they don't, they're not able to kind of see a way out of their current situation. And as a person in a support role, um, I part, you know, a big part of my job, I feel like is helping people reimagine what the opportunities are. You know, have you thought about, you know, the idea that you could do this thing or there's this resource or, you know, oftentimes young people are like, oh, I didn't realize that's possible. I didn't know that I could ask for that. I didn't, I didn't know that the university could do that for me. Um, and they don't ask and no one tells them and they end up, you know, tossed out or failing out or, or, or they just drop out and not, not really accessing the leverages that they could. Um, and so Nightline and other resources in my role here is an opportunity to try to help students when they're in their most vulnerable states um, understand kind of what, what, what is possible. Um, I'd also say that, you know, we have a bad habit of and I think this, this was brought up in the previous panel of like re-traumatizing people. And it, and it happens in higher education where we constantly ask young people to tell us your story. Tell us, you know, how poor you are, how traumatized you are before we can give you a resource. And I think we can change as institutions where we don't make it so difficult to get help. People shouldn't have to constantly tell administrators or people in you know, gatekeeper roles, what happened to them? 
it, it almost becomes, you know, what I would consider trauma porn, right? Like you're like this voyeuristic idea of, um, you know, why do you, are you deserving enough to get this help for this extra money, for this extra support? Um, as opposed to when we get, when we start talking about policies, there's also policies within institutions that could alleviate that, right? Like you can build in supports for low income students. They don't have to ask for every single thing that comes up. And I think when you are in a population where you've been traumatized or you're, or you're already feeling, you know, not inclusive. I, I work at Columbia university. There's, um, we have a range of students, but there are students that are extremely privileged. So if a student comes here um, that's low income or a student of color or the first generation college student, they of course would feel like an outcast. They'd feel different. And people shouldn't constantly have to be reminded of that in order to get the help they need to, to move forward. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you Stephanie, for that. I, um... Yeah, yeah. And I'm at Columbia, so, and I'm a student, so I understand a lot of some of what you said about being vulnerable, not being, um, not being comfortable asking for help. And then also that tell me your story, tell me your story, and whoever's got the best story would probably win, right? And it does become like trauma porn. So I appreciate all of that you just said. Um, Lauren, I want to come your way. Um, I'm a father of five, three of which of my children are teenagers, and I have two more from my wife, and they're like preteens. So there's a lot of young people in this house, to say the least. And I know that many of us on this phone are um, parents as well. Um, I wanted to ask you, how does trauma associated with bullying show up in school performance and in the home among siblings and other family members? Yeah, thank you, Pastor Isaac, um, for having me. And I just want to say thank you to Shawana and good evening to everyone. Um, I've been enjoying hearing everybody's uh, different opinions and, 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 and thoughts. So, um, but yes, I do, um, as far as trauma, I believe that everyone needs to understand that um, any trauma in your life, like the first step you need to do is find find out what it is because we all face our own trauma we all face our own battles uh, and then we need to heal and i feel like a lot of people skip the healing process um, and that's the most important step so i feel like whether that's going to find support um, talking to, to best friends family members um, do whatever you need to do to heal and let it out and then move forward um, and as far as bullying and, and how it affects you in school. From my own personal experience, my father has been incarcerated um, for the past over 20 years. Um, and it amazes people that we have such a strong relationship and such a strong bond. Um, he's my best friend and people are like, how? You know, like, how is that even possible? Um, growing up, I was so embarrassed because he wasn't around. I was so, as a child, I didn't understand, like, why can't I talk to my father? Why can't I go see him? Like, why isn't he at the, the dances and the parties and the holidays? And then as I grew older, you know, he said, I may not be there for you physically, but I'll always be here for you mentally. So I'm going to give you, I may not be able to buy you the things that you want, but I'm going to give you all the tools you need so that you can get the things you want out of life. And so from that point, I said, okay, once I was able to embrace my truth that my reality is, my father's not coming home anytime soon. So now I have to face the fact that, okay, what's the next step? I love my father. He's my best friend. I talk to him all the time. So now I just, I want to have the best relationship that we can under the circumstances that we have. And after that point is when everything in my life started to change. Like building my relationship with my father, I wasn't embarrassed anymore. I was able to come to school and be like, and focus on school. Okay, I want to get good grades so that I can call, like, so when my dad called me, I can say, hey, dad, like, this is what I got on this project. This is what I did. But it's all about actually facing your problems and, and healing and going through that healing process for me. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you very much for sharing that very personal testimony that. I definitely appreciate that. Cheryl, I'm coming your way, big sis. Um, 
I know that Sharon and others have touched on um, some of this earlier, but can you explain how, and this is where um, I'm, I'm uh, emphasis on the language, because this is a, a term I've heard um, invented and coined at the Center for Justice. I don't know if it was used other places, but punishment paradigm. Can you explain to us how the punishment paradigm in this country impacts formerly incarcerated um, men and women, but specifically women, their families and the communities collectively? Well, first I want to uh, thank Shawanda, uh, my hero. You know, um, you know, can't, I mean, everybody said everything that's needed to be said about you, but you already know how I feel about you. And of course, Isaac, my my little brother, of course, and and the amazing group that you put together. I mean, I I feel like I needed this group. You know, you know, just to have these conversations because you can't always um, have the conversations in other Zoom meetings in, that I've been in. Um, so just to get to your your question, Isaac, I mean, we as a society use punishment as a as a vehicle to get to social ills and to to seek power and control. You know, and and that's our way of dealing with. Um, not getting adequate health care uh, for folks, uh, not having good school systems, um, um, putting folks in, in prison instead of getting them the mental health services that they may need or any sort of health services that they may need. You know, that's our answer to that. But that's not only the answer to that. That's the answer to who we who we doing this to. And that is predominantly black and brown people, and that's predominantly people who come from poor neighborhoods. And so we all know the stereotype of there's a liquor store in every other corner in, in our hoods, and not so much social service agencies and things of support and things that could um, elevate us as a community um, to first um, get the services that we need and support one another and caring about one another um, in these communities. And so if it's not there, you know, from the beginning, if you take one in three black men out of our community and leave women um, with no support to care for their kids, yes, they may look for different coping mechanisms and they may um, even suffer from traumatic experiences just dealing with not being able to care properly for their children. You know, and then on top of that, you might have their men away for a lifetime, you know, who they love. You know, forget about they got arrested. Who they still love, you know. And so, and so, how do we deal with that? And so, most of the, the uh, any of you that have ever done any work inside a prison, anything that has to do with any sort of healing, any sort of circles, any sort of self reflection, is not being given by the state or the federal government. It's it's us. It's us that's giving that because we see it. Because we understand that you can go through a whole prison sentence and never really address the issues that brought you to prison in the first place if we rely on state-sanctioned programs. And so what we're doing right now is is having these conversations on, yes, it's, it's, it's nothing about us without us. If that's our motto, then that's for us to, to kick in and do the work regardless on who's not doing the work. So that punishment paradigm, is, it stems from these systems that keep us oppressed and that keep uh, us incarcerated and that keep us um, uh, in, a, in a place where we can't even get that foot off our neck, <laughs> you know? And so, yes, um, I encourage everybody, let, we got to work closer together and let's just forget who's not doing it because we're going to do it. And shout out to um, North Carolina. But taking that first step on reparations. <laughs> you know that's, right. that's right. That's right. All right, Kim, um, Kimberly, I'm coming down to you. What does it mean to be an anti-punishment attorney and activist? How does that impact your understanding about how trauma disproportionately impacts certain communities? And what can we do to change this? I know that's also a fully loaded question, but you guys are dope. So I'm, I'm confident that you have that. First, I, uh, I'm so grateful to be a part of this discussion. Um, Shawana, Isaac, this is really needed. And I'm so grateful to be a part of it, even as I'm losing my voice. So thank you so much. 
Shimona, they, they have tried to touch on all the things that you do, but I'm still kind of fully just uh, amazed that you do all the things that you do. So I'm just hats off to you. Um, well, I don't really know what all of that means, being an anti-punishment attorney and activist. I can say what it means to me. I know that mostly it's about centering values that are not expressed within what we see in our current system. For me, that's human rights. It's collaborative. It's basically affirming our humanity and to try to do this in whatever way we can. If it's through norm shifting, if it's through practice or through structures, any way we can do it. And so I've been you know, lucky to have a few different roles to play. As an educator, to me, it's been important to take a step back which is what everyone here is alluding to when we think about how the heck did this system come about? This colonial extractive system that put some of us on the path of chattel and the others who are basically extracted at maybe a, a lesser extent through indentured servitude and through work, through capitalism. All of these things are a system that keeps us right where it needs us to be and it keeps an ordering logic of white supremacy to do it. So we've been here, and it's so important, I think, for us to remember this is not just our problem. This has been an intergenerational systemic problem, and it's created structures of law, norms, customs, you name it. And so it's a very dense kind of thing. And when you think about that, just give people an opportunity to think about it, speak about it, reflect about it, then to the extent that I'm able to work as an attorney, uh, there are pieces of this problem that can be addressed through law, that can be addressed through moving the norm shifting to things that Shawana is proposing, which I think is important. Uh, I know at CSS we've worked on ban the box, we're working on expungement. These are things as we're working within a reform system. Now, let me just make this clear. I'm for reform until the revolution. I think we got to live as we try to get to the place where we're going. So these are things that are going to improve people's lives on a daily basis. So I'm with it, as long as it doesn't reaffirm the punishment structure. And that's the really careful thing we have to watch, is how do we do these things without entrenching it even more. And then finally, I think the thing that I'm most attached to in my work in the community is to propose alternative structures at the local level. And this includes things that are about uh, community land trust, self-determined, black and brown communities that take control of their resources, reaffirm their value set, do it through land banking, do it through time banking, find ways to nourish ourselves and create a zone and a structure for us, as we also have to push for broader protections that we've seen even after COVID, even after what we are seeing now with healthcare, we need these things. It should be a human right, it should be a basic right. We need all sorts of basic things. We need education, now whether the government structure that we're working with in terms of this particular corporate system of two parties is going to give it to us, I wouldn't necessarily say that's the case. But there are multiple ways of working, and there are all kinds of intersectional ways of working, so I'm committed to seeing that. But most importantly, let's get to the root. If we're dealing with hierarchy, and we're dealing with demonizing people under hierarchy, and we're dealing with extractive power from colonization to capitalism to, capitalism to wherever we're going, and the institutions that have come after that, which are punishment, and going through industrialization, we're in this system. And maybe there are other ways we can think around how we get out as we work towards revolution. Mm. I love that, Kim. We are all in the system. And just when you made those connections, it made it very clear. And it's like, how do you, how do you even get out of that? Because you step out into another systematic sort of flow of something different. Um, Britain, I'm coming back to you, big brother. Um, as, as, as like Khalil said, you said, and a few people have already said, voting is imperative at every level for several reasons. But I'm thinking about how important this upcoming presidency is, and I'm thinking about your organizing work with voter registration projects and civic education. I was hoping that you could give us all some organizing strategies that we can implement right in our communities to get more people, especially young people, registered and voting. Yeah. Make it a thing. Make it a thing. Talk about it. 
make it a thing. We, we're, we're very good at, um, especially in this generation of, of advertising and pumping things up and celebrating certain things. Make voting a thing. Make voting, make, talk about it. Make it a thing. Um, as a matter of fact, you can see, um, and, and there's a lot of data that shows, even in some districts where you have um, those little I voted stickers, people love to be a part of stuff. So when people started posting their I voted stickers on social media, they get excited and then they want to make sure they're up there to put their hashtag I voted too. Uh, you know, and you're seeing that make a difference in in in, in voting trends. And you know, even though it's by single digit percentages, but nonetheless, it's still an increase. So um, making it a thing, making it something to do. Um, and another strategy we, we often talk about is take somebody with you, actively calling on the grassroots level, the same way we grassroots and organize around so many other projects, so many other rallies, talking to someone, good old fashioned phone tree, text message. And man, um, I got a window of time to go up to the poll at 8.35. You think you can roll with me? You know, taking somebody with you, literally those influential, being being individual surrogates, being your own community surrogates is, is uh, will make a huge difference. Um, and in referencing this, this presidential election, um, understanding what the president's power, if you need something, a motivator, understanding what the most, uh, the the president's real power is, um, and it's the power to appoint. That's the power of the presidency. It's not the power to force legislation. It's not the power to come up with policies. It's the power to appoint. And what we see is this administration has appointed nearly 190 judges all across the country who will serve these positions for most of them for their lives, 20, 30, possibly 40 years. So this election is not for the next four years, it's for the next 40. So understanding that there are people who will, uh, and, and can't put the test, who will be levying judgments, who will be interpreting the law in front of, you know, in order for us to participate, we've got to make sure that we're putting our voices in political positions. Um, and what we what we're doing at the presidential election matters, but again, it's I believe in calling it the practice of voting. And what I mean by the practice is keep doing it. You keep doing it. So I vote for in in my presidential. Then I vote in my municipal, and I vote in my statewide, and I vote in my you know whatever whatever cycle your state is on, whatever cycle your municipality is on, I vote in the primary. Get in the practice of doing it. You start looking for it. You start becoming aware of it. You start putting yourself on that routine and that schedule. Um, it, those things are significant, especially when it comes to our youth, when it comes to, to helping our youth understand why it's so important, because it's, it, it, it's our practice of doing so. Um, they, whether they, whether you know, we have families who set routines for children to get up and go to school, and you have bedtimes for your kids, and they know their routines. As we start incorporating that, teaching them little small mechanisms about voting, um, just a little small in about me, uh, my fraternity uh, brothers always called me the diplomat. You know, I was always very diplomatic. I was always trying to vote on something. I was always, well, let's see how many vote, how many want to do this, and how many want to go here, how many want to go hang out with them, how many want to go hang out with them. And the, the problem was, it was always something. I was always in the practice of voting, and it inspired me to uh, continue to look for those opportunities to make change, make change, whatever I could. So practice, up to get a thing. Thank you, Big Bro. I appreciate that. And um, y'all heard that, everybody, all you community organizers, all of the organizations that are on the line, make voting a thing. You know, not just this this fall, but make it a thing, period. Um, assign some incentives to it. It can be as small as a pen or as big as a monetary. Whatever you're equipped to handle, 
um, do that, and especially do that in the lives of young people. Thank you, Brother Brent, for saying all that. He said, he said, he said this election is not for the next four years, it's for the next 40. You know, message, you know, we got to get that because that was big, and I didn't even know that. So I, I appreciate you saying that about, you know, the judges being appointed who will sit until they die. You know, and that's important because he can be gone from his seat, but that power still exists right where he left it, right? Um, so much, so much... Um, a different way of, of looking at the power. Um, I want to go over to um, Lauren and then to Stephanie again. I'm going to, um, Lauren, I want to ask you uh, in reference to what Brother Britton was saying about um, and, and what we were touching on with the youth. What do children and young people need to understand about trauma and what can educating youth on trauma look like? Is Lauren there? Do we have one? Sorry. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Don't worry okay. about it. Yeah, um, kind of just going back to what Britton was saying, uh, making it a thing. Like, we want to create a no bully, a bully free safe zone in schools. So, we want to make it a thing. Like, listen, I came here to learn. Like, he needs, he needs to get out of here. You know, like, it has to be like, bullying is not cool. Just like, Voting is cool. Like, come on, y'all. We're going to make this a thing. We're going to go vote. We're going to post this. We're going to be on social media. We have to learn how to um, embrace and, and And we teach peace, acceptance, and tolerance. So we want everyone to learn how to accept everyone for who they are. Uh, and I think that's the biggest thing in our generation is accepting people for who they are uh, and just taking responsibility for acts of for wrongdoing, bullying, or anything that's being committed that's just that's just not right or ethical. Um. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, Lauren. Right, right on that line, um, Stephanie, we've been talking about trauma as it relates to communities of color, but we know that trauma is present in the lives of many young people entering college. What do universities need to do better in order to support their students' healing? I think universities um, focus a lot on students supporting each other and creating, you know, accepting and open and liberal environments within students. But we don't really focus as much on what administrators or what faculty can do to provide those safe spaces for students and and or just acknowledging a student showing up with trauma in your office. Um, instead, you know, administrator, if a student's struggling or, you know, trauma shows up in so many different ways, it can show up as behavioral issues. It can show up as, um, you know, someone might say they have an attitude that maybe they, you know, are severely depressed. Maybe they have anxiety. Maybe they're not functioning or doing their schoolwork. Um, and too often, I think we come from a place of, negativity where someone might say like, oh, this person's not trying hard enough. They're not working hard enough. They're not interested in this. It's not important to them. When really, I think every, in particular, administrators should, every interaction they have with a student, they should come to it with, well, I don't know what this student has experienced. I don't know what things they're bringing with them to this day to end up in this situation. And so, um, you know, it's almost like trauma informed interactions where you give them the benefit of the doubt that something is going on for what has led maybe the situation astray a little bit. Maybe that's why they, the academics isn't going as well, or maybe that's why they're having this disciplinary issue. Um, I think the same within institutions like higher education can be said of our police force. People should show up and instead of coming to it with a authoritarian type interaction, it should be a helping role, right? We're in support roles. Um, people come to college to better themselves, to learn things, to provide stability in their lives. And that, that should be, you know, the first thought. It shouldn't be um, this idea that this student is, you know, trying to produce some type of harm or they are, you know, um, you two are at odds. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, so I think universities could spend more time of addressing that, making sure administrators know what their role truly is on campus and what type of students are 
showing up in their office. Everyone has, I'm, I'm a social worker, but everyone isn't, doesn't have that same training. And so, you know, a student might show up in the financial aid office and maybe you know how to do the numbers and you can disperse money, but students that go to the financial aid office are some of our most vulnerable students, right? They need money um, and they need your help to access this, this um, support. And if they're showing up, something's gone wrong. And if, and if, you know, you're met with someone that's maybe a little negative or they don't understand that a thousand dollars, a lot of money, they're like, Oh, well, it's only a thousand dollars. You'll be able to handle it. Well, that's not true. Right. And, um, I don't know that every administrator is aware of the student, the varying student experiences in a way that could be helpful. Stephanie, you just said, you, you just said something that touched home because I'm one of those students who have had the experience that with, um, with folks in different offices at Columbia. And we, I guess we do need more social work uh, people in these areas, right? Because it is just that and not, not being able to even connect those two things. If I'm coming to you with a money issue, this is a lot more than just, um, you know, what you think, you know, there's more behind why I can't even pay this, you know? And um, I think until we can tap into that, but I love what you said and how universities rely more on students to do that work than their own faculty and staff. And that's important. And um, I would love, I, I, at some point, we got to circle back and see how we do this at Columbia because we're all there and this can, this can happen. My last two questions are, are for the organizers. We have two organizers. Everyone on here is an organizer, forgive me. But I mean specifically, um, 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 Kathy, I mean Kathy, of course, Kathy, Cheryl, I'll say you guys' name interchangeably. But you and also Kim, you guys have a conference that you, you run annually. Um, um, Kim, your conference is more newer than the Center for Justice, so I'll start with you, and then we can end with you, Cheryl. Um, can you, um, Kimberly, tell us about um, the Full Participation um, is a Human Right conference that you organize every year at the, at the Community Church in New York. Tell us about what this concept is, because I, I, I fell in love with it, and I heard you hint at it earlier in what you said. Um, full participation is a human right. Can you tell us what that means, especially during these um, uprisings and this um, pandemic, and what changes does our society need to make in order to disrupt cycles of trauma? You don't expect me to answer all that, do you? Of course I do. You know that. <laughs> Holy cow, man. Well, first of all, I appreciate Isaac, you're one of the most generous people in the world. Thank you so much for what you offer. I, I'm almost embarrassed to be in the same room with Cheryl because what they do in, in terms of the impact at that conference, that's a movement building conference and event beyond the bars. That has influenced my development when I was there at Columbia. I had the opportunity to participate just even at the conference. What they do is bring people together from everywhere and give them a space. I mean, I don't even want to characterize it. So that's just a whole other experience. For me, in a different position, in, in a different place, uh, I am uh, working, trying to bridge gaps. And so a lot of what happens with the way I like to look at it is a human rights frame. Not because it's perfect, not because it's legalistic, but because it's normative and we can build on it. And that is, it's certainly more inclusive and more embracing of things that we all need to live in this society than anything that we see in our legal system. That negative rights-based constitution does not offer us housing, right to education, right to health care, right to all of these things, dignity. And they're interdependent because what we saw with COVID this year is you can't have health care without housing. You can't have all of these things in little bits and pieces. You have to think about what people, all people need. And by the way, beings, I would take it out of the human realm and think of us in terms of where we are on the earth. What do we all need to survive and flourish? Not look at the metrics of subsistence, the way people meet this out in a neoliberal way about, you know, what is our social welfare system going to give you when there are gaps in your work, you know, when in fact it's really what all of us need to develop and grow. So if you put that frame at the center, what does that require? And then how do we think about people coming back? We're all one community, but we've been bridged out we're okay, we're going to put people from punishment, that's re-entry. That is re-entry. That's a trauma system coming and happening. But we have to come back into the society and have all of the things that we all need. 
All of us do. You know, you don't go into a shelter and relapse. You don't go into an unsafe place. You have to have these things. So the effort there is to bridge people to think about their norms, think about it in the context of history, think of it in terms of how we can organize for policies, for culture shift, for value sets, for, and that's why the arts festival is integral to that. I've always agreed with you, Isaac, you're such an accomplished painter, and, and everyone else who knows how you reach other people in different ways. You need to, in Shawana, God knows, talent on so many levels. Those intersections, I believe, are required. So if we can get people to think more not on the baseline of what we have, but what we need moving forward, and it continually evolves. Our society is dynamic. God knows what we're going to see this year. So I wouldn't advocate this year for what, you know, I thought I was advocating for last year. But I know how I think people should be treated with dignity. We should uh, get rid of hierarchy, find ways to work with structures and create collaboration. Let's not reproduce that. So all of these things are part of that. And to the extent that that conference can engage people and offer that as a reflective point, then that's it. And this year, our theme is invest in us, the movement for a livable society. And these are, you know, many of you are here helping me with this. And, and we will hopefully have more conversation that continues. These conversations just have to continue, just like what you're doing. This is not a flash in the pan kind of, let's think about this. This has to be a practice, just as Britain said. And, and you know, so... Anyway, that's enough for me. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. I appreciate you so much. Cheryl, big sis, tell me about in what ways, um, and this, this kind of is a loaded one too, because it's for Women's Transcendent and Beyond the Boss programming at the center that you're leading um, both with, um, with, with the help of everybody else there. Um, how does um, these programmings that you lead acknowledge trauma in the lives of women and young people and contribute to the possibilities for healing, sustainability, and improved understandings within families and communities? I want to start by with Kimberly said, well, actually, let me just start by saying I just love Kimberly's uh, conference because it is in community. Sometimes we go back and forth with you know, I don't want this space to be intimidating. At the same time, I want this to be a space where folks feel welcome in, you know, because we have historically been excluded from spaces like this. And what we're saying at the Center for Justice is not, you belong here. You know what I'm saying? And so come in, feel comfortable, and let's let's talk about the issues. And so that's the first thing, and it's just creating a space where folks can feel comfortable enough to share that and we're not just talking about the experiences because i don't know how many of y'all heard of this term but we're not trying to story pimp anybody you know because as formerly incarcerated men and women we have been asked a million times to give our story and we are over it i mean if it's not you know uh looking at uh changing something that's systemic that affects ourselves and our community we just don't want to do it you know what I'm saying? Um, and so for you to get your PhD and go on to greater heights and just have that in you know, your portfolio. So we're not in, so much into that, but what we are into is saying that there's value and there's strengths from anybody, you know, who walks this earth. And I always like to say that we have grandmothers that come to our, our conference and they could actually tell you what's wrong with their community and have some solutions. And so I don't want, you know, as uh, academic institutions to feel like they are the end all be all. They can make a contribution, but so can a grandmother. You know what I'm saying? And so that's what we try to bring at Columbia is bringing folks together from all walks of life to to work on certain issues. And each year we, I mean, I was just saying this yesterday. Unfortunately, we never come to a point where we're not working on something that's relevant because that's how messed up this world is. You know what I'm saying? They give us a prompt each and every time to work on, you know? <laughs> you know? And so, and whether we're having uh, um, uh, young folks, uh, Corey and them did uh, uh, healing um, justice and people are still talking about their film they did last year. I mean, actually today. I had a friend uh, just talking about, oh, yeah, I saw that film in, 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 at Beyond the Bars. It had me um, 
uh, crying and I was just amazed at the young folks who was doing the work and um, and so this is what we try to bring there as far as a woman transcending you know we have to start to elevate not just the voices of women but their contribution to making change I mean oftentimes if we talk about the civil rights movement or any kind of movement that has ever been relevant in our country it's when they die that we was like, yeah, this person was was good, and, and she did this. No, we trying to give. How did how um my mom used to say, uh, give me my flowers while I'm alive, <laughs> you know. And and so yeah, that's what we're trying to do with women transcending, and also um using uh parts of the university and the school where we could uh sharpen uh their skills and also give them some tools to add to their tool belt. In addition to that, what we want to do is strengthen the, the community of women who are doing this advocacy work on many different levels. And so that we are so uh, amazed at some of the work that, because what you guys don't realize, and I'm going to say this to guys, because women already know, you can put us at a kitchen table and some food, and we're going to organize. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We gonna organize. We don't need a whole lot, you know. If the food is good, then we sitting at a kitchen table. We gonna we gonna we gonna come out of that kitchen table with a plan. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, yeah, it's like um, that's what we want to create here: uh, uh, an uh, an event or a family structure where we could just be as comfortable as sitting in somebody's living room or at somebody's kitchen table. We don't need. Um, all, all of the hoopla and things like that. We just need some dedicated folks um, who may not even, may not have the answers, but maybe the ones that are asking the questions, but have answers to something else. Because we don't know it all. You know, and we'd be the first to admit we don't know it all. So we bring folks in all together, you know, just to learn and to give and to share, you know, and to move on and to create these larger networks. Um, at one point, we were afraid to say that Beyond the Bars is a movement, but we totally believe that it is a movement because we stay connected with folks around the country, around the world now. I mean, we're connected with women um, in Africa and Australia who is doing work on end mass incarceration on this and then with their women in their systems and things like that. And so, yeah, that's what the, you know. That's what we're trying to do here. And again, the main thing, if you don't get anything else, is to provide these safe spaces that folks can come in and network and fellowship together and um, feel comfortable in doing it in a space where we have historically been excluded, particularly for women. I think it was in 1968 that women were even, was, was allowed to come on campus, you know, and, and so, oh, damn, that's in my lifetime. You know what I'm saying? I ain't talking about no 400 years. I'm talking about 1968. You know, so yes, I'm bringing women on this campus each and every time. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Cheryl. That was the last question for the panel. I'm gonna um, I got us all back here, Shawana. I'm gonna let you give us some closing words. I just want to personally thank each and every one of the panelists. Thank you all for staying on past. Um, thank you for all the panelists on the first discussion. Thank you for just giving and, and, and being so um, giving of your time and your energy for this. Um, this 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 goes a long way to completing this episode of the conversation, and we will be able to share this with more people. I'm going to add it to our YouTube channel and send it to you all so you can share it because more people need to hear this conversation. You know, um, there were hundreds of people listening today, but there will be a lot more who need to hear this and. I would encourage you to share this video, but I just want to thank you all again for um, just 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 for um, what you've done in my heart and helping me to heal and just listening to you. But Shawana, I wanted to let you um, and thank you, Sharon, um, um, Corey, and Ayula for staying on the line. Tonita, thank you, guys. Everybody, uh, oh, everybody, come on back. I see a lot of non-participant faces. Put show your face, show your camera. Lauren, turn your camera on. Leah, turn your camera on. Because all of you guys have, have, have been a part of making this happen. You know, thank you. Leah, turn your camera on. I know you're back there. <laughs> Come on. I'm um, Shawana. Take, take it away. What do you want to say about the bill? Um, after that, I'll, I'll tell folks how they can donate. So, first of all, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to everybody. Um, I know Khalil is not 
uh, on right now, but I really got to tell my brother, thank you. Um, it's funny. He said, I've been here for two years and this has been a long journey. And there were two people I can say when there wasn't a bill written, when it was just pain in my head that were listening to me. And, um, Khalil was one of those people. And he was like, well, you know, let me know when you flush that out. And I would laugh. And, um, I just, on this line, you, you like, so, um, Cheryl said, you want to give people their flowers while they're here. And while I was sitting in my house in my pain, Lynn Martin was listening to me. Darren Mack was listening to me. Khalil Cumberbatch was listening to me. And you got to say thank you to people who were there in the bottom. You must do that. And I just got to say thank you to those three people out loud and in public. Um, and I, I, you know, I thank God for everybody tonight. You guys were all amazing. Um, I thank God for collaborations that, you know, I've been able to collaborate with Isaac, um, and, and, and the confined arts and all the wonderful people he's allowed me to meet through him. And, and Cheryl, I just want to say thank you. You know, um, I met her and she's been amazing. And, and I'm so excited to know you. And, it, you know, for me, I, I've, I've, I've been in a silo by myself for a long time. And it feels good not to be alone because this work is going to take every single human. And we talk about redemption, right? We want to save everybody in prison. But everybody in this work is not redeeming each other. And I want to say that I am so glad that I am on this tonight with people who are in a space of redeeming each other. And it feels amazing because you know what? I'm talking about healing through pain and trauma. And we all have our own traumas. And this work is traumatizing. And so I'm so glad that everybody here is in a place where we can say we forgive, we heal, we can move on. That way we truly know that we are going to heal other people. And post-traumatic prison disorder is not, it, it, it was my pain, but I heard other people. And I know that it's not isolated for me. And I know that it's going to take everybody on this call and everybody listening and everybody in the criminal justice world to say, this is valid. And so um, please hashtag post-traumatic prison disorder. Um, please bring it up because we need to be acknowledged and we need the help. Therapy is very expensive and therapy is not a one-size-fit-all box. And so I'm asking everybody, call your legislators, call the people that are, that are in your Senate and your assembly and your Congress, because that matters. Letting people upstate know that we need a bill for mass incarceration and mental health, post-incarceration and incarceration. Uh, we understand with the sentences that we're giving out that we're praying everybody makes it home. But just because your body is captive doesn't mean your mind cannot be free. And so I believe that we should heal in our totality. And I believe that my bill is going to do that. Um, it took all my pain to help other people. And I hope that's what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And so with that, um, thank you. Thank everybody. Because I had a dream and, and I see that other people are with me on this journey mm -hmm. to healing. And I can't get whole without Isaac. I can't get whole without Cheryl. I can't get whole without Stephanie. I can't get whole without Britton and Lauren and Tanita and, and Khalil and, and, and Dr. Fuller and everybody on this call and Haiti who was over there in the house standing behind Isaac. Everybody is healing everybody. And and this is what this is what I want my movement to be about. And you know, Lauren is amazing. I want you guys to really tap into her. 
She's 25 and she's poured into my life. And I think that she's amazing. And I met Lauren because of her father. Her father is somebody that I deal with in Michigan, in Gus Harrison prison. And he is the most amazing man. And the journey that he's introduced me and he's telling me about his kids and how he loves his family. And it's just amazing. And I just want to say thank you. Um, Britton, thank you for all the work that you do um, in, in, in all your hats and capacities. And Kim, you are, thank you for standing with me even in things that are not related to this bill. Um, you know, Kim is on my health care journey with me as well. And I thank you, Kim. I, I genuinely, truly thank you. Um, Isaac, oh my God. Let me tell you, Isaac has just came and been the wind beneath my wings. Um, and, and, and I thank you out loud, Isaac, because people might not know you spend as much man hours as I do awake working on post-traumatic prison disorder. And you don't even know what that means, that somebody believes in you enough that they don't sleep either. Amen. And so thank you is probably not even enough, but I love you for loving me enough to be on the journey. And, 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 and it's amazing. And I just want to say to everybody that helps you, Lauren, Everybody, Lisa, you guys are all amazing. And because of Isaac, I know you. And I think that together we can all get a bill passed. And, and, and Tanita, thank you for reaching out because we're going to do a language campaign and a bill. And I just think that's, that's amazing. And Isaac has been on a language journey since I met him. And so I just, I'm so excited about endless possibilities. Um, but there, and Corey, <laughs> you're going to get some young people here. Um, and, and Iola, thank you for all the things you do in California, um, and everywhere else to heal humans. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing. I just want to thank you. Thank you for being on, on, on this tonight with us. Um, you guys are amazing. So just, and Sharon, I do not want to end without telling you I love you. When you can pick up a phone, call a place, ask somebody, can you come? And Sharon let me come to Hopper House and didn't know me but trusted me enough to deal with the women that she facilitated. And she doesn't know what that meant to me. I didn't know about her pastor and I didn't know anything about her. I ended up being there hours after we had finished. And I remember her praying and showing me her journey and just being my big sister and checking on me when she doesn't have to and telling me she loves me. And I know that what she's telling me is for real. So Sharon, thank you so much for investing in, in somebody that you don't know, but yet love because I see that there are women who are showing Christ even when they don't tell you what they title is. Um, I just want to say thank you. And Britton, thank you for the opportunities that you are giving me because they're absolutely amazing. Um, Cheryl, I look so forward to building with you um, because all the things that you do are amazing. And when everybody I met, even Kim, I, I heard your name three times in one day, and that's why I had to meet you. I said, wait, hold on. And, and, and so to know that people love you, even when they can't see you, what they say in front of you doesn't really matter, but what they say when you're not around is what counts for me. And I hope that I do enough work and redemption that when I'm gone or when I'm not around, that people still say good things about me. And, and, and like I said, last Zoom, um, I got some health challenges that are really um, interesting right now in my life. And uh, I'm in the midst of needing a heart transplant and gallbladders removed and all type of things and surviving cancer and just the gamut. And like I tell Isaac all the time, this bill is not about me. It's bigger than me. So even if I have no breath in my body and my healing doesn't come on this side and it comes on the other side, 
I need everybody to still pass this bill because it wasn't it wasn't about me. Mm-hmm. It's about everybody. It's about everybody that is sitting in prison. It's about my mother. It is about being born in prison, shackled and chained to a mother who had the dream of a hope and a slave who is me to be better than her. So this bill is way past me. It is, it is, it is for people. It is for children of incarcerated parents. It it is, it is for for children like me. It is for children like Lauren. It It is for everybody who's been incarcerated and everybody who wants their family to be whole in their totality. So I think if I think outside of me and I depend on all of you, then I know this bill will get passed. So I just want to say thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you for Shawana. loving me enough to show up. Thank you. I'm going to um, thank you, Shawan. And I, I wanted to give you that time because it's important that folks know where the heart of the bill has come from. Because while this is an issue that a lot of formerly incarcerated people might have mentioned, only few actually took it and championed it and made it into a bill. So I want to just appreciate I want to say that we appreciate you for that i'm gonna um i'm gonna let us transition out i'm gonna put up a different screen but on the way out bob i had a question a question came through that i believe only you can answer but maybe i'm just um forgive me if i'm wrong but it was about the bill and getting it acknowledged um is the point should we be striving to get this um recognized medically to be inserted into the dsm-6 would that help You know, that was a question that we had. And then after he answers that, I'm going to switch screens and we can get out of here. Hey, Isaac, that's why you were at that meeting in Columbia a couple of years ago. That's exactly what we wanted to do. We we know that it exists. So part of what you do, for the benefit of people who would be treating it, is give them some sense of the dimensions. How do you diagnose it? How do you take what could be a momentary annoyance and separated from something that really is a result of traumatic experiences that both suffered while they were on the inside. It's easy enough to do, uh, meaning that the ways in which you can do the research to make that possible are definitely there. The large participation you've had on this call alone indicates that it's just a question of lining it up, getting people to talk about it, identifying some of the statistical patterns, and then using it as a way of helping those who are doing therapy, either in group or doing stuff one-on-one, to figure out how to make use of what we know to be its symptomatology, to figure out how to come up with something that looks like a series of really effective treatments. But some of the treatments people already know. I keep going back to a couple of things that, that happened at that first session. We've got a lot of knowledge also about how to treat it, so that would also be a part of the research. It's not as if we don't know what we're doing. We're just trying to make it more systematic. Cool. I appreciate you, my brother, for, for giving us that information. I'm sharing, I'm sharing a different screen, but before you guys get off screen, I just want to clap it up for everyone to see um, how much I appreciate you all. God bless you all. Um, we're letting you go. Enjoy your nights. Enjoy your family. Um, thank you so, so much for your time. So much for your time. It's, 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 I can't thank you enough. Thank you very much, you all. Peace.